hello everybody this is james Lindsay. you're listening to the new discourses podcast and today we've got a hell of a podcast to do in fact i feel like i need to frame this one a little bit um before i get started i don't want to do too much of this because it's already going to run long i think it's it's a very difficult topic that i want to convey it's going to require some reading um so for those of you that follow the podcast regularly you'll know that i've been doing a series about uh, critical education theory, better known as critical pedagogy, or maybe it's not better known as, but it's more rightly known as critical pedagogy. And if you're following along with that series, uh, which is kind of diffuse, sprinkled in with some other podcast episodes as well, you'll know that I've gone backwards in time and I am deep within Paulo Freire, who, or Freire, I should say, who is recognized pretty widely as kind of the grandfather or godfather, if you will, or intellectual godfather, but not the intellectual father of critical pedagogy. That would be Henry Giroux, who is uh, the considered to be the father of critical pedagogy or critical education theory as it exists in the United States. And of course, Paulo Freire is most famous for what's called the pedagogy of the oppressed, which I intend to do a full multi-part, probably four-part, maybe more series on eventually here on the podcast as we uncover this. I realize I've got to spread out or I don't know, I've got to, I've got to get into my critical pedagogy mode a little bit differently because I can't keep just talking about this old history stuff to show you where it comes from and kind of what it really is. I've also got to give people useful tools for dealing with what they're actually encountering in the schools like uh, social emotional learning. Uh, of course, I kind of touch on that in the Groomer Schools podcast series that I did, but also culturally responsive education, ethnic studies, and so on. So I'm going to have to work some of that in. But at any rate, if you're following along with that broad series of critical pedagogy and its long history and what it really is, you will know that the first thing I'm following this book by Isaac Gotsman, a Marxist education theorist from Iowa State. And it's called The Critical Turn in Education that explains how our education system turned to critical theories or critical Marxism, as he calls it. And what I'm doing is going through his book. And then as he talks about other books that are the primary sources he's referring to to tell his story, I'm going into those books. And so the first chapter of Gottsman's book goes into Paulo Freire and his influence and characterizes him, as I said, as kind of the grandfather or godfather of critical pedagogy and giving the title of father of critical pedagogy to Henry Giroux. And the first book he talks about is called The Politics uh, of Education, which was Freire's 1985 work, whereas Pedagogy of the Oppressed was, depending on who published it, 1970 or 1971. Giroux wrote the introduction or foreword to the politics of education. And the last episode I left off with in this series was going through the first half of Giroux's foreword to this book. I intend to go back to the second half of that foreword soon and then to read you excerpts from this book so you can really understand Freirean thought because Freirean thought is the, um, I mean this in a very literal way, theological bedrock upon which critical education theory has been built, and it must be understood as such. But the issue that I have is that as I read through this book, uh, when I did the previous episode of the podcast, I'd only read a couple of the chapters beyond the introduction, and now I've read the book. Um, What I keep running into is this overwhelming view of how religious Freire's writing is, and the reason Freire was so influential is that he's provided basically the basis for the woke theology. And uh, the last podcast of this of that series so far covered the idea of critical hope, which I'll probably have to come back to and do a whole other podcast on eventually, as being kind of the big thing that Freire brought to the table. But there's more than that that Freire brought. And so what I'm as I read this book, I just kept thinking, I've never really explained to people why I think that Marxism is best understood as a theology, not as a social theory, not as an economic theory. Certainly communism could be understood that way as social or economic theory or kind of both socioeconomic theory. But Marxism is a very specific approach to either socialism or communism or actually both. And I am quite convinced it's a theological 
uh, development. In fact, I've argued in the past that it's scientific or scientistic Gnosticism. Uh, it's a Gnostic religious movement. And, you know, that observation is not original to me, of course. Um, Eric Vogelin is probably a Catholic philosopher, um, is probably the prominent, most prominent name in that in the in the list of people who have identified it as such, um, and I will actually read at the beginning of this episode some from Vogelin. I will read some a short section out of uh, Science, Politics, and Gnosticism, which is a short and difficult but very important book if you want to understand Marx and Marxism as scientific Gnosticism. I have an essay on new discourses you should check out uh, in regard with understanding this. That's called the, I think it's called the catastrophe, but it might be the calamity. I can't remember one of those two words of scientific Gnosticism. So you can go find that and and read that and th- you'll see that what, what's gone on, and we'll see this shortly out of Marx is directly, is that the pre-modern era where uh, religious magisteria kind of ruled thought was coming to a close Um, or maybe had really in meaningful ways come to a close by the 1840s when Marx was taking up a lot of this philosophical writing. The modern era was blooming. This is a scientific kind of um, post-enlightenment reason, empiricism, pragmatism, or the big philosophical currents going. And then Marxism comes in as as another, which is actually based out of Hegelian dialectical faith and Rousseauian anti- reason, a very sentimentalist, uh, subjectivist view. And in fact, when you combine that with the Gnosticism, you actually have a profoundly subjectivist religion, uh, where the subject becomes the center of religious view. And in fact, the subject becomes a creator of the external world. And, um, this is Without understanding this and understand the way that Marx organized his thought in this kind of weird man-centered modernist style new religion is to not understand Marxism at all. Of course, not to belabor the point, but we're now kind of in a postmodern era that actually derives off of both Rousseau and Marx, again, to a new era of thinking that's rooted in images and power and narratives and discourse as being kind of the dominant strain But Marxism has to be understood as a modernist religion, whereas something like Catholicism or Protestantism or Islam or Buddhism are pre-modern religions. Um, Marxism is actually a rather terrible but modern religion, and it has a theology at its heart. And that's what I want to kind of uncover because I don't feel, and just this is again that framing, I don't feel like you can understand what I see in Freire. I don't want to keep being perceived as a crazy person until you understand what I see in Marx. And uh, so I'm going to read quite a bit from Marx, uh, in particular from his um, his what's called uh, Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, which are also known as the 1844 Manuscripts or the Paris Manuscripts. Um, this is 1844 is four years before the Communist Manifesto was published. Obviously, if you can do the math, that's 1848. And uh, Capital was uh, 18, I have it written down somewhere in my notes, but 1867, 8, something like that, to give you a picture of the, the dates of when everything's going on. So this is some of Marx's earliest writing. He's 24, 25, 26 years old when he's writing these ideas. And um, before I actually get into Marx, though, I'm going to go straight into Vogelin and uh, actually read to you a couple of pages from Science, Politics, and Gnosticism. Now, the trick here is by invoking Vogelin, I've already lost a lot of people who are left inclined, not that they listen to me anyway, but I've already lost them because one of their mottos is Eric Vogelin not even once because Eric Vogelin uh, characterizes Marx um, very poorly. Uh, and connects him to both Gnosticism and uh, Hegelian speculation. And in fact, that's where I'm going to pick up if you end up with a copy I have, which is, I guess, a Gateway Classic, uh, Gateway Edition. Um, It's on page 16. I pick up right from the top of this page. And if you can hear the book, I'm actually reading it out of a print book. Believe it or not, they still exist. 
Um, Marx, he says, this is Eric Vogelin, Marx is a speculative Gnostic. Now, before I continue reading, let me point out that reading what I said I'm going to read from, which is the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts from 1844, according to Vogelin, that particular set of manuscripts is when Marx realized, or when he realized that Marx was a Gnostic and that, that unlocked being able to understand Marx and being able to understand Hegel is that they are actually coming from a perspective of Gnosticism. So you can go back and listen to my long Hegel podcast where I talk about that in detail um, if you want to as well. Uh, but this this is kind of Vogelin summarizing that um, speculative means that he's using the Hegelian speculative method, not that Hegel was the only person to ever use speculative philosophy, but he was certainly a speculative philosopher. Speculative means not doing necessarily what we would call speculation, although sort of, uh, as a more technical term, it refers to a speculum, which is a Latin word for mirror. And so uh, what the idea was for Hegel, and this is actually relevant for Marx, is that you are it's figuring out how the world works or philosophy in general is actually a speculative process. In other words, you see things that are happening in the world and then you sit in reflective contemplation and you imagine seeing them uh, reflected in the perfect realm of ideals or if ideas, not ideals. That's so there's a lot of Plat Platonism or Plato's philosophy with the realm of ideals coming into the way that, that Hegel was thinking. And so Basically, this idea of reflection is going to be very key to understanding how this theology works. And by the way, before I go any further, we're speculative, Gnostic, etc. Um, let me just point out, when I say that Marxism, I should say, that Marxism is not a, or, sorry, is a theology. I don't want to get into some weird discussion about, you know, compare, there will be some comparisons to Christianity. I don't, it's very easy to talk about Christianity in terms of theology. I don't just want to do some cheap kind of point by point comparison here. Um, and the reason is because the theology is a science or a broad study, comprehensive study of the divine or of the nature of God. It's very easy to do that for something like Christianity. But with Marx, Marx explicitly, not only does he uh, not put God into a story, he rejects God quite explicitly. Vogelin documents that. He's quite angry about God. He wants to not only end religion, the so-called opium of the masses, which we'll read about, but also that he wants to recharacterize God in a completely different way and do away with God and have a completely atheistic philosophy. But it's also a very Promethean rebellion against God theology that he has going here. So I want this to be not just this kind of like cheap thing where it's like, an, here's the inversion of Christianity, da, da, da. But the harder part is to understand that for Marx, the, rather than a theology being the study of God, it's actually the study of man. And this only makes sense when you understand this subjective perspective, which is very um, derived from Rousseau and Romanticism, but also when you understand um, that uh, man as creator is replacing God as creator. And so when you see it in, in that regard, the, the creative capacity being essentially infinite and, and in a sense absolute, uh, man takes on the characteristics of God. Of course, when we start to invoke characters like Prometheus from mythology or even Satan, uh, this is those themes kind of come up. So you kind of get a flavor of what kind of theology Marx has, depending on which way you want to frame that. And Marx was big into Prometheus, and Vogelin covers that as well. So let's just go back here. I'm going to read a couple of pages um, from Vogelin, or at least most of a couple of pages. Uh, Marx is a speculative Gnostic. He construes the order of being as a process of nature complete in itself. Nature is in a state of becoming, or if you'll remember that from the Hegel podcast, that these are becoming religions instead of religions where God is, God becomes. And in this case, it is man that has to become because man stands in the place of God. Um, nature is in a state of becoming and in the course of its development has brought forth man. Quote, man is directly a being of nature. We're going to hear that again shortly. Now, in the development of nature, a special role has developed upon man. That being 
which is itself nature, this is very complicated, this being which is itself nature, uh, which is itself nature also stands over against nature and assists it in its development by human labor, which is the highest form, which in its highest form is technology and industry based on the natural sciences. Quote, nature as it develops in human history, as it develops through industry, is true anthropological nature. And this is from the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts that he's quoting. In the process of creating nature, however, man at the same time also creates himself to the fullness of his being. Therefore, quote, all of so-called world history is nothing but the production of man by human labor. This is key, by the way, to understanding Marx's philosophy. That's again from the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts. And to understand that Marx's philosophy is in fact a theology, but instead of a God-centered uh, science, if you will. It is a man-centered science with man taking the role of creator. And when you understand how man becomes creator in Marxism, you understand how it's a theology. Let me just read that quote again. All of so-called world history is nothing but the production of man by human labor. And so the other thing we have here, and I'm going to be more cautious than than Vogelin with the word labor, although that's quoting Marx here. Um, Labor or work, work holds a very uh, sacred place in the Marxist religion and you, uh, theology, and you have to understand that. What does it do? It produces all of history and in the process produces man. So man creates himself. How? Through labor. Labor is somehow sacred. And this is where the ideas of uh, the working class being kind of this sacred underdog, um, a kind of... Uh, uh, noble savage, if you will. And that's a very important, turns out that's actually a very important way to characterize the working class for Marx as a noble savage. Uh, but as almost a, a holy thing, um, that's where it gets its basis in Marx's view of work as a uh, theological commandment um, and a duty of conscience. He says that Vogelin, the purpose of this speculation is to shut off the process of being from transcendent being and have man create himself. This is accomplished by playing with equivocations in which nature is now all-inclusive being, now nature as opposed to man, and now the nature of man in the sense of essentia. This equivocal word play reaches its climax in a sentence that can be easily overlooked. Quote, a being that does not have its nature outside of itself is not a natural being. It does not participate in the being of nature. That's quoting from Marx in the epistemic, uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts from 1844. In connection with this speculation, we're back to Vogelin. In connection with this speculation, Marx himself now brings up the question of what objection the patriarchal, or sorry, the particular individual, that's in quotes, that's a Marxian term, what objection the particular individual would probably have to the idea of the spontaneous generation of nature and man. Quote, the being of itself, of nature and man, is inconceivable to him because it contradicts the tangible aspects, all the tangible aspects of practical life. End quote. The individual man will, going back from generation to generation in search of his origin, raise the question of the creation of the first man. He will introduce the argument of infinite regress, which in Ionian philosophy led to the problem of the origin. To such questions, prompted by the tangible experience that man does not exist of himself, Marx chooses to reply that they are, quote, a product of abstraction. Quote, when you inquire about the creation of nature and man, you abstract from nature and man. End quote. Nature and man are real only as Marx construes them in his speculation. This is That's very, actually, Hegelian, by the way. Um, that's the nature of speculative philosophy. Um, should his questioner pose the possibility of their non-existence, then Marx could pr not prove that they exist. In reality, his construct would collapse with this question, and how does Marx get out of the predicament? He instructs the questioner, quote, give up your abstraction, and you will give up your question along with it, end quote. We will actually read in full context that part of the epi uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts uh, later in the podcast. 
If the questioner were consistent, says Marx, he would have to think of himself as not existing, even while in the very act of questioning he is. Hence, again, the instruction, quote, quoting Marx again, do not think, do not question me. It sounds pretty scientific, right? Um, the quote, individual man, however, and however is Vogelin's word, individual man is a concept of Marx. The individual man, however, is not, ob uh, not obliged to be taken in by Marx's syllogism and think of himself as not existing because he's aware of the fact that he does not exist of himself. Indeed, Marx concedes this very point without, however, choosing to go into it. Instead, he breaks off the debate by declaring that, quote, for socialist man, and back to Vogelin, that is, for the man who has accepted Marx's construct of the process of being in history, such a question, quote, becomes a practical impossibility, end quote. The questions of the individual man are cut off by the ukase of the speculator who will not permit his construct to be disturbed when, quote, socialist man speaks, and we're going to talk a lot about social or socialist man, man has to be silent. So socialist man is a Gnostic. He has special insight into the world and how the world works. This is Marx as a speculative Gnostic. Now Vogelin has uh, substantiated that argument. So let me make sure if I didn't want to read more than that. Um, I think that's as much as I wanted to read. So, oh no, it's not. So I'll skip forward a little bit uh, about this whole argument. And then this is, this is kind of a key point. Um, a couple of pages later, here's what, what Vogelin points out. He says, and now for the Marxian suppression of questions, which we just discussed. It represents, as we shall see, a very complicated psychological phenomenon, and we must isolate each of its components in turn. First, the most tangible. Here is a thinker who knows that his construct will collapse as soon as the basic philosophical question is asked. Does this knowledge induce him to abandon his untenable construct? Not in the least. It merely induces him to prohibit such questions. But his prohibition now induces us to ask, was Marx an intellectual swindler? Such a question will perhaps give rise to objections. Can one seriously entertain the idea that the life work of a thinker of considerable rank is based on an intellectual swindle? Could it have attracted a mass following and become a political world power if it rested on a swindle? But today... But we today are inured to such scruples. We have seen too many improbable and incredible things that were nonetheless real. Therefore, we hesitate neither to ask the question that the evidence presses upon us, nor to answer. Yes, Marx was an intellectual swindler. This is certainly not the last word on Marx. We have already referred to the complexity of the psychological phenomenon behind the passages quoted, but it must unrelentingly be the first word if we do not want to obstruct our understanding of the prohibition of questions. So that's Vogelin talking about Marx, and particularly talking about his work from 1844, his earlier work, which preceded the Communist Manifesto, and thus also preceded rather significantly uh, Das Kapital. And the first word, if we take Vogelin at his word, that we have to say about Marx is that he was an intellectual swindler. In other words, he was fudging it and he knew he was fudging it. And Vogelin has quite the intense takedown of Marx following that. Uh, he was cheating people intellectually and he knew he was doing it. So he said, don't question me. But he says that's the first word. And I think that understanding Marx as a theologian rather than as a philosopher is going to be a later word that we're going to have to get into. And so that's really what we're going to try to do in this episode of the podcast, the New Discourses podcast here. And we're going to not go into the epistemic, uh, well, I keep saying epistemic and I don't know what the hell's wrong with my brain, the economic and philosophic manuscript of 1844. But instead, we're going to go to a different thing that Marx wrote in 1844, probably when he was 25 years old in February of 1844. Part of the introduction to a contrib actually the very first page of the introduction to uh, Marx's a contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, which is its own topic, and we're not going to dive into the philosophy of right uh, at this point. So, since very sweeping terms, we're going to switch to actually reading Marx Marx directly at length and giving some commentary. He starts off for Germany, the criticism of religion. <clears throat> 
has been essentially completed, and the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism. So that's the first sentence here of of this piece. Now let me break this down. I already what is this first part? The criticism of religion has been essentially completed. Okay, so this is the transition to frame it the way that I already did from the pre-modern to the modern era. I don't think that the critique of religion um, was actually complete personally, uh, but the kind of very enlightenment rationalist criticism of religion had been made. Um, and so he's seeing this new scientific era that has le- that leaves the superstitions of the past behind. So for Germany, he says the criticism of religion has been essentially completed And the criticism of religion, he goes on, and this is the more interesting part, the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism. Why? Because the the church was an absolute hegemon. It was the pre-modern hegemon uh, throughout all of uh, Europe and, and Germany, not least. And so by tearing down at religion, you open the door to be able to tear down at anything. Um that carries kind of the power of hegemony as it later got named. And so the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism. Criticisms can only flourish in a place where you don't have the religious stamping it out. Um, The profane existence, Marx says, the profane existence of error is compromised as soon as it's heavenly speech for the altars and hearths. He says that in Latin, but I will spare us my inability to read Latin has been refuted. The profane existence of error is compromised as soon as its heavenly speech for the altars and hearths has been refuted. So the heavenly speech has been refuted. Profane existence of error is compromised as soon as you refute the religious word. Man, who has found only the reflection of himself in the fantastic reality of heaven where he, th- where he sought a superman, meaning God, will no longer feel disposed to find the mere appearance of himself, the non-man, unmunch, where he seeks and must seek his true reality. The foundations, uh, the foundation of irreligious criticism is man makes religion, religion does not make man. May I call for my participation in the um, New Atheist Movement, because that certainly was something the New Atheist Movement uh, pushed very hard. And, you know, we don't want to stain too heavily the name of the rather brilliant and eloquent Christopher Hitchens. But Christopher Hitchens made this point all the time. Man makes religion. Religion does not make man. Whether he knew he was, quote, he probably did know he was paraphrasing Marx, uh, being extraordinarily intelligent and well-read. He was a Trotskyite, of course. How much he repented of that, I don't know. Um... But man makes religion, religion does not make man. This is a complicated view. I don't think it's that simple, but this is Marx's claim. So religion is totally man-made, is the view. Um, And he goes on to, I mean, I don't want to take time doing this, but why is it complicated? Just to be clear, because religion is such a profound influence on the way that man lives his life, that religion is profound in how it shapes how man lives life, and therefore using the exact kind of thesis that Marx makes about the progress of history, religion is actually making man as well as man making religion. And this, if Marx was actually consistent with his views, he would see that religion was making man, and it was making man religious, and that religious man might have been actually not that bad of a thing. Um, but I digress. Marx continues, religion is indeed the self-conscious. This is a brutal, brutal sentence uh, and it's indicative of his view. Religion is indeed the self-consciousness and self-esteem of man who is either not yet won through to himself or has already lost himself again. So this is, again, you have to understand that Marx is creating a man-centered theology. And so what is religion for Marx? Well, it's what you it's what you do in order to have self-consciousness, self-awareness, self-esteem when you haven't realized that man is sufficient in and of himself or where you had that, but you fell off the wagon and lost yourself again. And so you subsume yourself to this deity that is a creation or a construct of your own imagination or of a, a social pattern or whatever it happens to be. And so religion, he says, is the self-consciousness and self-esteem of a man, who, of man, not a man, of man who has either not yet won through to himself, not put himself at the center of the universe, or has already lost himself again. 
But man, that's in italics, is no abstract being squatting outside the world. Man is the world of man. And then there's a dash, so I have to say that because it reads weird out loud. Man is the world of man, state, society. So state and society become crucial concepts to understanding what man is, and state and society are the world of man. And man is the world of man, is Marx's claim. So what I just said about religion, take it out of religion and put it in state and society, and that's what's making man. Man is the world of man. This state and this society, he says, produce religion, which is an inverted consciousness of the world, because they are they are an inverted world. Religion, this that by the way, we are now getting very much into the kind of Gnostic view. Um, this is this is Gnosticism, th- th- which is the idea in this regard that um, that the God, for example, is not really God. He he's he's a false god, and he's in fact a tyrant. Uh, but as he says, it's created by man to enslave himself and. Uh, that the, the the tyrant enslaves man, and that the true Gnostic knowledge, or knowledge with a G if you want, uh, G N O W, haha, pun. Uh, the true Gnostic knowledge reveals that God, in fact, is 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 a is a, is a construct and a tyrannical construct, and or even a demon in the pre-modern sense, and that you can have true knowledge of that which precedes God. Uh, outside of that, and so this is the the we're getting very gnostic already. But he, so he says it's an inverted consciousness of the world because they are an inverted world. Uh, religion, he says, is the general theory of this world. Its encyclopedic compendium, its logic in popular form, its spiritual point to honor, its enthusiasm, its moral sanction, its solemn compliment. And its universal basis of consolation and justification. It is the fantastic realization of the human essence, since the human essence has not acquired any true reality. The fantastic realization, so fantasy, of the human essence, since the human essence has not acquired any true reality. Well, the true reality of man is in the world of man, right? So man in himself is the true reality of man for Marx. So it is a man-centered religion. You must understand what Marxism is. The struggle against religion, Marx tells us, therefore, is indirectly the struggle against that world whose spiritual aroma is religion. Religious suffering, he tells us, is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So what in the world did that mean? Because this is a key idea from Marx. It's often quoted and remarked upon. So when you suffer with religion, what he's saying is you've created a fantasy, God, religion, the purpose connected to your faith, etc., that suffering has meaning and so on. And so that you have real suffering, but you're protesting against actually experiencing that real suffering. And so religion is what you do when you're oppressed, that it's a sigh of the oppressed creature. And so it's what you do when you're oppressed, but you don't want to do anything about your oppression. You want to rationalize your oppression. You want to create, as Marx would see, a religion, an ideology that explains why it's just and reasonable that you are oppressed, rather than taking the steps to overthrow oppression. Therefore, it is the opium of the people. It keeps you calm and sedate, even though you're in conditions that should be painful and intolerable. He goes on, The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of people of the people is the demand for their real happiness. Okay, so religion lets you pretend you're happy and that you have a good life and it's as good as it gets. But in fact, that's fake. That's an illusion. And to abolish that illusion is to demand a better life for real. So the people's real happiness. To call upon them, Marx tells us, to call upon them to give up their illusions about their condition. Religion includes those, re- those illusions about their condition. that They're oppressed. Is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. Illusions 
So what he's saying is if we get rid of religion, people will realize that they're oppressed and they're going to say, no, we're not going to keep being oppressed. We're going to solve our own problems. The criticism of religion, Marx tells us, is therefore in embryo. The criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. So now we can kind of roll back to that beginning thing where he says that it's not just a hegemon thing that I said before. The criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism. Why? Because when you criticize religion, you give people, you get rid of the ability for people to say my suffering. You get rid of their theodicy, actually. We just use the, the theological term, their justification, the religious justification for evil. You get rid of their false hope that if they pray or that if they are sufficiently pious or whatever, that God will deliver them. You get rid of that and you put the mantle on people and say, no, you've got to unoppress yourself. You've got to tear down this oppressive society uh, yourself. And in fact, you can only engage in this criticism after you get rid of uh, religion, because religion is the thing that's working like an opiate to prevent people from feeling the weight and the terror and the horror of the repression, and therefore to take action to end the repression. Criticism, Marx tells us, has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. That's a poetic way to say what I just said. The criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses so that he will move around himself as his own true son. Religion is only the illusory son which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. Again, you must understand that the Marxist theology is Marx setting up man in himself as creator, as deity, to throw off God and say, no, it's not you, God, it's me, man, that's actually the center of the universe. It is me who is the creator, not you. And in fact, I, as a man, created you. And I know that I created you and could create otherwise, including the kingdom that you promised us or the garden you allegedly expelled us from with the secret knowledge that I have. And the secret knowledge Marx offers is so-called science. But that's we've discussed at length before on the Hegel episode that that's the, it's the science of it's the, Hegelians, the Hegelian view of science, which is much broader than, than science as we see it, uh, as it's actually practiced by, say, the scientific method or whatever, but it's more akin to the science that we're dealing with now in the world today, where Anthony Fauci is the science, for example. So he says that, that <laughs> it's so clear, is um, that the criticism of religion disillusions man. So you get rid of your illusions, you confront reality as it actually is, so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses, so that he will move around himself as his own true son. Religion is, the, is only the illusory son, which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. It is therefore the task of history, once the other world of truth has vanished, to establish the truth of this world, it is the immediate task of philosophy which is in the service of history to unmask self-estrangement in its unholy forms once the holy form of human self-estrangement has been unmasked. And that's what the religion of Marxism is supposed to do, by the way. Humans have estranged themselves. And they created God as this tyrannical thing that threw them out of the garden, which is the act of estrangement. And it's all a fiction. And uh, his goal is to unmask the goal of this theology. Is, the, the theology holds what I just said. And the goal of the religion is to unmask the self-estrangement in its unholy forms. Once the holy form of human self-estrangement has been unmasked, thus the criticism of heaven turns into the criticism of earth. In other words, criticizing religion allows us to engage in critique that will remake the world, the criticism of religion into the criticism of law, and the criticism of theology into the criticism of politics. And so that's from the first page of Marx's contribution to the critique 
of Hegel's Philosophy of Right, written in February of 1844, and that gives us a basis for talking about Marx in a theological way, although I think that it's going to be fairly clear. Um, kind of picking up where we left off, though, left off, though, what on earth does, does Marx mean about this task of history? And that for that, we've really got to understand what Marx means by history. And I, when I write about Marx now, I capitalize certain words, and you can't hear me capitalizing them when I speak, but those words include history and communism and socialism to indicate that they are Marx's views of those. Now, Hegel also was a historicist in this regard, uh, but not as strictly as Marx was. And so history has a very special key meaning. And history is actually the, how can I summarize this? It is the kind of the sum total of all of the interactions and phenomena of human activity as it unfolds and in the process creates man changing from one epoch of time to the next. Uh, so it's everything that man has done as a society, past, present, and then eventually into the future. Uh, reading from Marxist.org, which is a wonderfully useful resource, in fact, reading from their uh, dictionary or encyclopedia, I forget which one they listed as, as Marxist, of Marxist terms, they say the Marxist study of history seeks both the, it says the, but it must be two, both to elucidate the conditions and first and foremost, the material conditions under which historical struggles are fought, and then to identify the agents who make history. So the Marxist study of history looks at two things. One is, what are the conditions that led to the struggles that people were in, and then who and why, and I guess how, were they involved in those struggles, and thus making history? For Marxists, the age, and this is key to understanding this, for Marxists, the agents or subjects of history are not focused, this is reading from Marx, Marxism.org, Marxists.org, for Marxists, the agents or subjects of history are not focused only on the prominent individuals whose voices speak the aims and consciousness of the masses, nor on masses of people trapped by circumstances, nor on the ideas which animate people, but specific unities of all three. The subjects of history are self-conscious masses of people whose ideas and aims are inherited from the past and given new form in the voices of individual spoke spokesperson and leaders. So this is if this is the kind of very Hegelian thing with Hegel, it was that the idea inspires the state and the state creates a society and eventually the society realizes its contradictions and overthrows the old ideas and creates new ideas in a revolution of ideas that then creates a new state that then creates a new society and on and on and on it goes. And man is the product of the society uh, in this. And so that's the becoming nature of, of the Hegelian dialectic as it bears upon the ontology of man, what, what it means to be human and how human beings come to be. Marx has taken this to another level by saying that history is all of the struggles that man has had against and in, in light of his conditions. And the people who are involved in the struggle are the subjects of history. And the only ones who count are the self-conscious masses of people whose ideas and aims are inherited from the past. So they understand history as Marx would present it and what it means teleologically in terms of uh, how history is going somewhere uh, and it came from somewhere in the process. Uh, so inherited from the past and given new form. So there's that revolution uh, in the voices of individual spokespersons and leaders, which would be like the men of action that Hegel referred to that certain men like Napoleon come along and are men of action that put into action the new ideas for a new epic of history. Um, and what these subjects of history actually are, are A, those men of action, those prominent individuals who speak the aims and consciousness of the masses. That's all Marx counts them as. But also B, masses of people trapped by their circumstances and C, the ideas that animate them. So that's who the subjects of history are. They are the self-conscious masses. In other words, they're the people who think this way about history. The subjects of history are people who think about history the way that Marx wants people to think about history in terms of the, his, the, the unfolding history of uh, the unfolding, I guess, trail. I'm trying to avoid overusing the word history here. The, the unfolding trail of, of sets of circumstances and epochs of time uh, 
as they go from one state to another, whether that's from primitive for Marx's stages of history from primitive communism, where the tribes have communism, but they're estranged from one another into slave economies, into feudal economies, into capitalism, and eventually going forward into the future into socialism and communism, according to the way that he thought history would unfold if the subjects of history were able to gain enough power to be able to affect those ideas, which he thought was inevitable because it's a religion. Carrying on from Marx, though, No one of these three aspects of a historical subject can be active without the others. A mass of people without organization and without a consciousness of its own, uh, sorry, without a consciousness of its own demands. Notice the word demands. We hear that a lot today, right? So um, a mass of people without organization, without a consciousness of its own demands cannot make history. And nor can a leader who does not voice the aspirations of the masses. So you have to have a you have to have organization. That organization has to be built around uh, the ideas of of what's wrong, their their own oppression, and what demands need to be made to to make history. But then they also have to be organized around a leader. But that leader must also reflect the voice and the aspirations of those mass that mass of people. He says, sorry, they say, this is being Marxist.org, the subjects of history are not the, quote, forces of production nor the laws of history, but instead people make history always acting under certain material and spiritual conditions. It is these conditions and how people sought to change them which give meaning to the stories that are told in history. So subjects of history is therefore a designation of a religious tribe for Marx. You are just like if you were to accept Christ as your savior and become a Christian, when you accept this understanding of history and the unfolding of material conditions according to a trajectory of that history with man as the creator of history so that history can create man in an unfolding and becoming process, a dialectical process, you become a subject of history. Uh, another term for this will end up being social man when it's sufficiently, or socialist man, depending on how you translate it, when it gets sufficiently advanced. And it is a designation of a religious tribe uh, for Marx. And the object of which they are conscious is history itself. Is, and that's the object of their theology. History becomes, for Marx, the object of the Marxian theology. So the, it studies how men make history unfold so that it creates man reciprocally. They actually call it the inversion of praxis. Uh, So it actually has a a name for it. Um, So the the subjects of history are the people who are aware of their own conditions, how those conditions arose, why they are oppressive, and how they might change those conditions toward liberation, Uh, a modern term for subjects of history that we're hearing applied to our children in schools right now is that they are change agents. They are people who are aware of the structural forces of society and the the oppressive nature of those forces and the need to make a change and that are inspired to become activists to create that change. So change agent applied to your child at school in our critical pedagogy world is actually one of Marx's subjects of history updated in the terminology and slightly changed in how you think about it. And so... History for Marxism as the object of its theology is therefore the trajectory of change as created by the work of so-called conscious people, people who have consciousness. Okay, so we're going to dip out of this for this this line here for a second. Remember, this is a religion based off of man, man creating man through the activity of man, which creates history in the process and the conditions of history at any given time create the man of that time, and then the conditions are contradictory and need to be uh, found intolerable by conscious men, and the conscious men awaken to the intolerability and the contradictions of their situation, and then they create a revolution, uh, and so history is made and progresses. That's the Marxian theology. That's man as creator, but creator of what? Not only the conditions of society, but of the world itself and of himself within that society, within that world. Man is the, what is it? Man is the world of man, which is the state and society. That was the statement from um, his 1844 critique. So again, a little quick comparison to Christianity. For example, you have this Trinity and we're going to focus on the 
Christian Trinity, not that Trinities don't appear in other religions as well. We're going to focus on the Christian Trinity because the Christian Trinity so heavily informed Hegel, who so heavily informed Marx. And so in the Christian Trinity, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the theologic, uh, the theology of that is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are tripartite godheads within uh, tripartite uh, features, I guess, of God within a single godhead. That is, so so they are co-eternal and continuous with one another. All three are eternal. All three are, like, is like they are unchanging before time, outside of time, throughout time, across time. They are, I am the I am, so-called uh, Yahweh. I am the Alpha and the Omega. God is in the Christian theology. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit as the Trinity within that is. It's three aspects of, in a sense, of a single unity that does not change, that is perfect, flawless, and eternal uh, and so the three components are co-eternal. The key to, to understand this is that they are. This is Christianity is not a dialectical faith. Uh, God is. God is not in the process of becoming. That turns out to be a hermetic idea, which is to say an alchemical idea. Hegel, being an alchemist or a hermeticist, um, brings into a different idea, and he says for for him in the place of the Father you have the absolute or the absolute idea, and that gives rise to nature and the world as its abject other against which it comes to know itself. And the manifestation of the absolute idea at its stage of understanding itself in the world is the state. That's where Hegel says the state is a divine idea as it exists on earth. That's a direct quote. The state creates a circumstance that people live in, which gives rise to a spirit or a geist in German, or in general, the society, the culture of that. And like I said before, what happens is that that culture realizes that the idea is not, that it, that the whole thing is based on, and thus that the state is implementing is not perfect, because Hegel was an idealist, a speculative idealist. Uh, so the idea leads everything. The idea gives rise to the state. The state gives rise to the culture, the geist, the spirit of the people. And eventually the contradictions contained within the imperfect idea, the un incompleted idea, where the absolute and the world itself see do not recognize themselves as being one and the same, uh, leads to a revolution in the idea. The idea actually awakens a little bit. So it's not that it just changes. It, it awakens a little further. And then this process repeats. So the absolute is updated. It becomes more self-conscious. The self-consciousness gives rise to a improved state. Uh, a new society arises out of that. And eventually, again, there's a dialectical revolution. And so we have a dialectical trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the absolute idea taking the place of the Father, the state taking the place of the Son, and then the spirit of the culture being the Holy Spirit that is a reflection of that idea channeling through it. But this is not a static, I am co-eternal, blah, blah, blah theology. This is a dialectical theology that is based on the idea of becoming. So the absolute becomes aware, more self-aware, more completely aware by the process of this unfolding. Uh, this ties into the other another big philosophical dialectic that he Hegel was very interested in, which is that the dialectical opposite or the opposite in general of being is nothing. This is an ontological question. So being is at the base and what's its opposite is nothing. But how can you have being and nothing in opposition to one another? Well, that which is must have become from that which is not in some way or another. And so becoming the process of becoming what something is from what it wasn't previously. Uh, if we have some wood and we engage in a process of making a table out of the wood, the table becomes as a process of that, uh, as a result of that process. And in fact, you'll notice that I did something that's productive work as an example here. 
because productive work actually even Hegel recognized was the seat of all value, the creation of all value. But this is a God that becomes. And for Hegel at the end, the eschatology of Hegelian dialectical faith is that at the end, the absolute idea finally realizes itself. It finally realizes that is perfectly continuous with the natural world, that the world is not actually another. It is in fact perfectly continuous with it. And the, uh, the idea awakens as the absolute. So the, 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 the theoretical idea and the practical idea unite or the subjective idea and the objective idea unite into the absolute idea that is wholly complete, neither theoretical nor practical, but simultaneously both neither object subjective nor objective, but simultaneously both and is perfected. And so the perfected idea, this revolutionary becoming dialectical process finally comes to a halt at the moment of the, the eschaton, which is immunitized this way, when the absolute idea realizes itself, because then the absolute idea is realizes that it is deity and therefore perfect. It is the absolute idea that's last uh, reckoning that it has to have is to understand itself as the de- as perfect. And then that gives rise to the perfect state, which gives rise to the perfect society. And so the revolution, uh, the revolutionary nature of this becoming process grinds to a halt. And that's the Hegelian dialectical theology that Marx took and inverted, as he says. He said that Hegel had this upside down because he said that idealism is nonsense. He said, if you look out into the world, what we think is the idea is actually human beings looking at the world that already exists and, in fact, understanding them in human terms. So he put in place of the absolute, you could think of it like a triangle, right? The absolute in the place of the father up above giving rise to the, the son down below on an angle and then giving rise to the society. And then that gives a new idea. And you can picture like the spiraling triangle with absolute on as a point. Marx flipped it upside down. So you can think of a downward facing triangle now with man at that bottom point. And the man who sees, who understands that he's man in himself takes the place of the absolute. But he, man doesn't realize that he is complete and in the position of creator because it's a dialectical unfolding. But he is, how does he realize that? Through state and society. So man gives rise to the society, which has reflected in his consciousness, which is a kind of spirit. And then that gives rise to the state. And then the state produces a new man. And you have the revolutionary becoming dialectical process again. But now in place of a deity in the form of an absolute ideal for Hegel, you have man creating himself. And the trajectory of this process, which is a theological, dialectical theological process, the trajectory of this process of man creating himself by creating society and a state and, a, and then himself Slowly realizing his his own perfected capacity as man in himself, but man living in society, dialectically fused, and thus no longer needing a state to uh, encode society and enforce it upon man in the next iteration, the trajectory of this dialectical process is what Marx refers to as history. So man creates history, and by creating history, so creates himself, and that is the central theological claim of the theology or the religion of Marxism. And our, unfortunately, our Supreme Court missed the opportunity several times to the 20th century to name Marxism a religion, I guess, because they didn't understand this. A lot of trouble would have been sidestepped had Marxism been named a religion, because obviously if the Marxists, who are hell-bent on getting power, wanted to be named a religion for all the protections that that gives you under the First Amendment, then they would have done so, but they have not done so, and they vigorously resisted having that occur because they don't want to be named a religion because then the First Amendment would preclude them from being able to occupy positions of the state, which in their religion they must because the state is in the position of the son, the son as in Jesus, as if we go back to the Christian trinity. So by creating history in this theology, what which is what man does, man is creating himself. So this is a weird bootstrapping theology. So for Marx, mankind has bootstrapped itself into the status of creator and man, which is above the animals. There is no angels or God, so to the pinnacle of creation, 
And the, 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 he achieves that status at Pinnacle of Creation by being a creator. And this, how is this done? And this is a sacred aspect of work, authentic work, the kind of productive work, like creating a table out of raw materials like wood, felling the tree, shaping the wood, hammering and nailing it together, gluing it together, whatever is involved in creating the table, creating something productively through his work, man is creating a world that is humanized. And in the humanized world, he sees himself. So the way that man creates history and sees himself, becomes to see himself as the creator of history and thus of what makes man man rather than beast, which is the pinnacle of creation, this is a theological claim, is done through man's authentic labor. Work, really, not labor, because labor is when it's been co-opted by somebody else making you do it, and not mere activity, which is what the animals do. So Marxism as a theology makes authentic work sacred, and the division of labor, therefore, becomes fundamentally evil, and mere activity, satisfying your basic needs, without, say, food, sex, whatever, uh, is, is animalistic and base. So you can see this, how this works, right? So the division of labor, somebody becoming the boss or organizing a company or whatever, the division of labor is the fall of man in the Marxist religion. It's what kicked us out of the primitive gardens and primitive communisms that existed in all the different tribes was that there, there was no division of labor. They had primitive communism, even though they were estranged from one another, those were individual different gardens. And the goal at the end of history, stage six for Marxist stage stages of history, communism is when we return to a global garden where everybody's in the same garden and there's no division of labor. So for Marx being a materialist, looking at stuff that was coming out of Darwin, looking at his, his one of his mentors, Feuerbach, he's the product of this evolution, which was barely understood in 1844 when he was writing this. He's a product of this evolution somehow, but this evolution was guided all along by the necessity of, and this is key, social relations. Social relations are what determine what history looks like in this Marxist religion, thus who are the producers and who are the managers who are exploiting the producers through this division of labor. And so for Marx, there is no human nature inside man except our base animal nature, our sensuous nature as he would have it, and then what man has made himself into by making the world for himself, humanizing the world and thus humanizing himself. So there is no human nature except what man has made for himself through his social interactions, which are the key way to understand this for, for Marxism, and how those social interactions reflect and the product of his labor reflect off his underlying animal nature, whether that's satisfying hunger, thirst, sex, shelter, other needs. So for Marx, the fundamental ontological question of what it means to be human is based in the idea that human nature is wholly contingent upon the nature of the social relations in each period or epoch of history. And this is something that is unfolding again through this dialectical process and men are making history and thus making themselves and making new aspects of human nature, which are reflections of those social relations at each period. So history is the history of social relations as created by man and it is the history in this sense that makes man as a becoming entity with the goal that he will eventually become social man who is fully conscious and social man who is fully conscious um, no longer believes in the division of labor, has abolished all ideology and fantasy, and is now living as a truly free and independent being. We can get a taste of some of this by reading from Marx again. We can turn, here's a short quote from the German ideology, which was a very influential work of Marx. He says, as individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, with uh, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of the individual thus depends on the material conditions determining their production. And then in another piece, or another work by Marx, Gundris, or Risse, Grundrisse, I can't pronounce things in German, uh, G-R-U-N-D-R-I-S-S-E, 
S-S-E, Grundrisse. Uh, he says, not only do the objective conditions change in the act of production, for example, the village becomes a town, the wilderness, a cleared field, etc., but the producers change too, in that they bring out new qualities in themselves, develop themselves in production, transform themselves, develop new powers and ideas, new modes of intercourse, new needs, and new language. You can imagine, I'm just using the example he gives, the village becomes a town, the town becomes a small city, the city becomes a metropolis, and you can see life in the city is very different. City, city slickers aren't the same as country boys in some sense, and this is kind of what he's looking at in that regard. But he says, but the objective conditions change in the act of production, but this causes man to change. The city, the city man is actually somehow fundamentally different, according to Marx, than the city slicker, I guess I should say, than the country boy. And it turns out that that's not actually true. You actually can take, I mean, they say you can't, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. But you actually can. Um, you can take a country person and put them in the city and they get accustomed to city life and they live according to what's going on in the city. And you can take a city person, you can stick them in the country and eventually they become uh, accustomed to country life or whatever. So he sees this though as a, as, as the, the, what's happening is that the production itself and the outputs of the production as kind of a sacred object produced by sacred work um, are actually creating a different and new kind of man that at the end of history at communism can be perfected into these kind of perfect social entities. Um, and so the view within the, the Marxian ontology of man is that man is incomplete and in fact, completable. And But because he's man, and therefore of high intellect, he knows he's incomplete. And the project of history is the project of man making man, completing man. And the conscious man, who are the, the subjects of history, are the people who are conscious of the fact that they are making history, that they are changing conditions and thus changing man. Toward what? Toward becoming social man at the pinnacle which is man in himself perfected by the dialectical material materialist process that I, I gave a, a description of earlier, that cyclical man creating society, society creating the state, state conditions creating a new man, um, institutions giving birth to who people are. That's why I've told you before that the left is overwhelmingly where we, where your typical conservative would see that the family is the fundamental unit of society. Your typical leftist, especially a Marxian leftist, is going to see the institution as the fundamental unit of society, and the institution creates the man. And so they do things like call the family an institution, um, but they think of something like an orphanage, and they want the state to raise your children as an institution, and that's going to make men a particular way. And now you see the nightmare of what's going on in our public schools. Um, so the way that man creates history and thus completes man, which is social socialist man or social man, which is the communist in the proper finalized communist society where man and society are co-continuous at the after the eschaton at the end of history, which is the unfolding of this process of making man is through work and work is not activity like a beast, like uh, typical animals walking around hunting and eating and digging up roots and eating or whatever animals do. Uh, that's activity for Marx. And work is something different and not labor because that's for somebody else's profit. He, work is what brings a man's own vision into the world. He then sees himself in that vision. This is why it's a subjectivist religion. Uh, while spiritually elevating himself through the act of A, work itself, and B, humanizing the, cre the world around him that's his abject other that he's comparing himself against in a very kind of Hegelian way. So for Marxian theology, the idea is that if we humanize the world, we humanize the man. And so the goal is to build the garden. So Marx talks all the time about the need to humanize the world, humanize man, humanize society, and so on, humanizing everything. But the fundamental view of this Marxian labor, no, work-oriented society or theology is I, cre I as man created that, so I am creative, and in the end, I am the creator. And so man in himself looks upon his creation and sees that it is good. And in fact, he sees himself in his creation and sees that he is good. That's pretty deep. <laughs>
Let's bounce for a second, though, speaking of what is good, since I've invoked this kind of theological language. The idea of the good, according to the Marxist.org uh, encyclopedia, they, they give you just a little bit. I'm only going to give you just a little bit, but they don't, it doesn't say much. Accord, but this is the key idea. According to Hegel's logic, which I will point out that Marx adopted, the idea of the good is when the subject tries to mold the world in the image of itself. So this is a very difficult point to understand. It's very hard. And I think this is why Marxism tricks so many smart liberal types is because they don't understand that they're under they're they're reckoning with Marxism on their own terms and their own terms are the post or the, the modern enlightenment terms or the pre-modern religious terms where there is a world out there and we are receiving information about that world through our senses and we are therefore reacting to that world uh, the objective world exists outside of ourselves. In in a subjectivist view, this is not how it works. And this is the kind of romantic thing where we're looking at, at whether it's Rousseau and kind of the people that followed from him, uh, whether we're looking at um, William Blake, who is a gigantic influence on Marx, who's a complete Gnostic and subjectivist lunatic. Um, for them, there's this idea of this subject object split. So the question, a deep basic philosophical question, I guess I have to kind of go off on a tangent again, is that the world exists out there and we perceive it and we have subjective consciousness of what we perceive. And so we are unfortunately trapped in our subjective consciousness, which is an interpretation of the world as it actually is outside, but the world is actually out there as it is. The subjective, fully subjective view does not take that position. And if you try to interpret subjectivist stuff from an objectivist perspective, you're going to get lost on what's really going on and you're going to misinterpret what they're saying. And the subjectivist thing, the world is not actually out there. All there is is your subjective consciousness and it's creating the world. So if I look right now, for example, at this lamp in my room, the lamp is not there. There is a uh, subjectively, there's an experience of that lamp in my head, but philosophically, I cannot know if that actually exists or not. Am I just a brain in a vat is kind of the usual kind of meme level expression of that. Maybe this is all a simulation. That's another meme level expression of that. Maybe none of, maybe we're plugged into the matrix. None of this is real. And that lamp isn't really there. It's just being that whatever's happening within my consciousness is experiencing that lamp. And at the full extreme of this, that's all there is. And so Marx is actually in that position, but in this weird kind of dialectical way where objective and subjective have to both be reckoned with. So the good, according to this view, is when the subject, that's the person who's creating the world in their own consciousness, tries to mold the world in the image of itself. So that's where you're trying to merge now what might really be out there, although you don't technically know, with what's actually in your head. That's good when you are trying to mold the world in the image of itself. But that presupposes that you're molding the world inside your head and having it conform to that what's out. But that's actually, I'm confusing that with the so-called idea of the true, which is more of the objectivist perspective. So going back to this Hegelian idea, Hegel insisted that the world is the abject other of the deity, which, by the way, is alchemy. This is hermeticism. Um, the deity is the absolute, the ideal, and the world is what the uh, has been produced by the ideal as an abject other. An object. So the subject comes first, and the object follows. That's why it's subjectivist, and it's uh, orientation. And the goal of the dialectical process for Hegel is for the subject to realize that the object is part of itself and in fact completely continuous with itself and it was all along. This is the same goal as Marxism, but now it's not the deity in the form of the absolute idea, this perfected God created, this God level idea of, of how the world is, is actually, actually is. The subject is now man, man in himself. And so the world out there is being created by man. 
in himself and the world is his abject other. And by doing work upon the world, man realizes that he is in the position of creator that shapes the world. And thus through the idea of praxis, which is that you then reflect on what your work has achieved, you then change your idea of yourself and then you can change the world and then you can reflect and you can change yourself. So you have this dialectical wheel of, of, um, well, it turns out that the dialectic of praxis is, is that you have theory and that theory gives rise to action and that action gives rise to reflection and that reflection gives rise to an adaptation of theory uh, in an end, endless spiral. And so for Hegel, the world is the abject other of the deity, which is the absolute. So the subject comes first, but the absolute doesn't recognize itself but it created the world as an image of itself so that it might know itself through the dialectical process in full dialectical synthesis, which is said to occur at the fusion of the theoretical and the practical, which Marx retooled through the idea of work. The Marxian view here then is that man in himself is imagining looking back, this is complicated, imagining looking back on the creation of history with the uh, with the image of utopia as as the standard and is seeing that it is good and that the will uh, and and will therefore uh, create the vision of utopia of the world by doing work so the world the image of the actual world is this communist utopia that already exists except that man is estranged from it because of the division of labor and what he's doing by doing work, which is actually unfolding the dialectical materialist wheel, is he's trying to create the utopia by making history as he goes. And that's what's good. And he will do that by doing work, which is conscious activity with a perfected end in mind. And the process, again, like I said, is called dialectical materialism, where the work is identifying the contradictions and the material conditions and the social conditions uh, that he, he finds himself in, putting those up against one another in continuous conflict, oppressor versus oppressed, until synthesis is achieved using the master-slave dialect that the oppressed have the view of the oppressor and of what it's like to be oppressed. So they bring a second view, a second consciousness that moves the dialectic. And it is achieved through cyclical revol uh, revolution in the making of history. So work, or rather maybe the work, do the work, is the sacred charge of the Marxist. And the work is the socialist work, which is to humanize the world until the world is perfectly humanized and man becomes social man that lives in socialist society. So this is a socialist, and they, we heard the word earlier, spiritually and laborious productive process that changes the world materially, and by changing the material conditions of the world, he thus changes his social relations that define those material conditions of the world and thus changes himself. So that means that the hammer and sickle, which are, are the symbol of communism, are actually a religious symbol. And they are a religious symbol of productive work and its capacity to remake the world into the image of itself, which is the utopia, the communist utopia, which is in a sense the tended garden. In other words, getting back to Eden how through the Gnostic vision of realizing that God is the jailer and getting doing away with that as the first step of criticism and then remaking man to a perfected state in the process. So for Marxism, and we're going to get a little heavy here, you must do the work. Why? Because, and pardon my German, because Arbeit macht frei. Work makes free. Work creates freedom. Labor doesn't create freedom. Activity doesn't create freedom. Work creates freedom. Arbeit macht frei. How? By creating the conditions under which man is no longer dependent because his needs are being met through work, but also the conditions in which he's able to use his work to create spiritual improvement through reflection that leads him to realize eventually that he is free because all domination and ideology are dispelled, critiqued into the, uh, to the ground, ruthless criticism of all that exists, as Marx had it. And this is called praxis.
in reciprocation, work is only work versus being activity or labor when man is actually free and doing work out of his freedom and for his freedom in order to continue to make his freedom. So socialist work is the only real work, but productive work is socialist work when it's not being exploited by the capitalist who is taking off the surplus value and has transformed work not into a Arbeit Macht Frei, a process of making freedom, but rather has transformed work transmorgified work, I guess, into an exploitative process that is the producer of alienation and estrangement. And so this is why they hate the capitalists. <laughs> and so this is the, the this is the crazy material religion of of uh, Marxism. And so just to get an idea, though, with this role of work versus activity versus labor, I'm going to read briefly from uh, Freire. In fact, from the politics of education, which is why I got into all this podcast in the first place, in a section where I finally was triggered and was like, okay, I've got to go look into this from Marx and I have to communicate this. And it's on a, it's, this is a paragraph where he's explaining the difference between work versus activity. Um, he says, this is Paulo Freire, uh, Freire. Um, there is a further fundamental distinction between man's relationships with the world and the animal's contacts with it. Only men work. A horse, for example, lacks what is proper to man, what Marx refers to an example in his example of the bees. Quote, at the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. That's the end of the quote. Back to Freire. Uh, action without this dimension is not work. In the fields as well as in the circus, the apparent work of horses reflects the work of men. Apparent work of horses reflects the work of men. Action is not work because of the greater or lesser physical effort expended in it by the acting organism, but because of the consciousness the subject has of his own effort. His possibility of programming action, of creating tools and using them to mediate between himself and the object of his action, of having purposes, of anticipating results, still more. For action to be work, it must result in significant products which while distinct from the active agent at the same time, condition him and become the object of his reflection. As men act upon the world, effectively transforming it by their work, their consciousness is in turn historically and culturally conditioned through the inversion of praxis. According to the quality of this conditioning, men's consciousness attains various levels in the context of cultural historical reality. We, were, we propose to analyze these levels of consciousness as a further step toward understanding the process of conscientization, which becoming uh, socialist, basically, becoming conscious. Uh, that's Paulo Freire explaining the difference between work and action. One of the biggest things that Paulo Freire brought that I think makes him such a huge religious figure in the woke religion um, is that he understood Marx. And he understood Marx, I think, much better than most of the Marxists up until Freire. Uh, so what is this thing about the bees that we quoted? And I want to like dwell on it a little bit. I'm actually going to read that, that actually the passage he's referring to is from chapter seven of Capital, which was uh, 1867. There's It is in my notes. So I'll read the full paragraph from which uh, the, the analogy of the bees is given from Marx. And this is, like I said, in, in um, Das Capital. Um, labor is, Marx tells us, in the first place, a process in which both man and nature participate and in which man of his own accord starts, regulates, and controls the material reactions between himself and nature. He opposes himself to nature as one of her own forces, setting in motion arms and legs, heads and hands, the natural forces of his body in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adapted to his own wants. By thus acting upon the external world and changing it, he at the same time changes his own nature. He develops his slumbering powers and compels them to act in obedience to his sway. We are not now dealing with those primitive, instinctive forms of labor that remind us of the mere animal. An immeasurable interval of time separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage. We presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human. So he's using the word labor instead of work, by the way. 
And so uh, let me, before I continue to get to the bees or whatever, um, you, you see exactly what we're talking about. You know, nature's productions are in a form adapted to his own wants. That's what he does. Uh, he appropriates nature's forms to his own wants by acting on the external world and changing it. He, at the same time, changes his own nature. He's making himself by making the world. Uh, and the key thing, if we remember Freire, is that he had the image in his head. We're going to come back to that. That's a that subjectivist thing again. He's making the world in the image in his head, which is, in a sense, his own image because that's conditioned by the inversion of praxis, which is to say the material relations that he's in. So you see this as a circular religion. Um, so a spider, going on from where we left off, a spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver. And a bee puts to shame many an architect in his construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of the bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process, here's the quote, at the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. Okay, so let's pause before we continue and I'll come back to this line. This line is so important. So within the theology of Marxism, what makes work authentic and what makes work real is that you have, as a, as a potential worker, a vision of what you want the world to look like inside you. You are the creator. And in fact, your subject, subjective consciousness, you already see the product of your labor in your mind's eye, and then you go and make it. You're not, if you want to cook some food, you're not slopping around in the kitchen. That would be mere activity. You have a vision of what the cake is going to look like when it's baked, and you methodically, in, or, in an organized fashion, put together the cake, and you produce the cake according to what the image in your mind already is. So the image in your mind, you as creator, have created that in the world, and thus you learn that you have the creative capacity. In other words, you know that you are like God. You can create the world, but we dispense with those fantasies in Marxism, so you actually are God your man in himself. And so that is a very, very, very key idea. What distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. And at the end of every labor, uh, labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination, already existed, that's an ontological claim, in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only affects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi, and to which he must subordinate his will. And this subordination is no mere momentary act. Besides the exertion of the bodily organs, the process demands that during the whole operation the workman's will be steadily in consonance with his purpose. This means close attention. The less attracted by the nature of the work and the mode in which it is carried on, and the less, therefore, he enjoys it as something which gives play to his bodily and mental powers, the more close his attention is forced to be. So that's where this bees thing comes from. And you see what I'm talking about, about work being the way that man is resolving the dialectic of man bootstrapping himself into the position of creator within the Marxian theology. Who is the god of Marxism? Man, but not any man, social man. Man that realizes that he's man that's supposed to live in a society. This isn't, by the way, the first time that Marx brought up the bees and animals. In fact, the economic and philosophic manuscripts from 1844 where we started are really kind of where that comes up. Now, just a quick little curious sidebar. The, uh, these manuscripts were written in 1844. They did not inform Marxism, however, up through, say, the beginning of the Soviets. Why? Because they weren't ever published until 1932. And uh, and then in more languages, originally in German, and then in many languages uh, in 1933. Um, why? I don't know. Who had access to them and knew what they said? I don't know. Um, but they were actually not published. They were written in 1844 as most theological writings, but they were not published until 1932, at which point 
you are looking at the rise of the Frankfurt School and you're watching the neo-Marxists reckon with the failure of Marxism and the neo-Marxists are looking at this stuff written from 1844, the very earliest Marx when he was the most Hegelian, his critique of Hegel, uh, for example, that we already read from, these uh, manuscripts from 1844, and they're like, shit, something went wrong. And then they're going back to Marx when he was still his most Hegelian, not as much following what he wrote in the manifesto and not as much following, especially what he wrote some 20 or so years later in uh, Capital. And so uh, let's go ahead and turn to these economic and philosophic manuscripts, because I want to give you an idea of, like I've quoted from them, I talked about a Vogelin quoting from them. I want to give you an idea of just how kind of religious they are. So we're going to look at this. He, he talks about these bees here uh, in, in that manuscript, in those manuscripts as well. And he starts off in the section I want to read. This is a section about, he's in a, it's a chapter really about, it's sort of a weird word, but all of this estrangement of man, a man, man being estranged from his labor. How? Because labor has been co-opted by the capitalists and become forced labor, which alienates and estranges man from the product of his labor, but it also estranges man from man. That's the conflict theory between the bourgeoisie and the capitalists and also workers competing against one another by the result of this. So it estranges man from man, man from his product, man from his own nature. And in this, we have estranged labor producing estrangement from his essential nature as a human. And he starts off here by saying man is a species being. Not only because in practice and in theory, he adopts the species as well as, his, as well as those of other things as his object. So in other words, he's working on himself to make man a higher level, to make mankind higher level, right? He adopts the species as his object. And this is only another way of expressing it, he says, also because he treats himself as the actual living species, because he treats himself as a universal and therefore free being. The life of the species, in both man and animals, consists physically in the fact that man, like the animal, lives on inorganic nature. And the more universal man or the animal is, the more universal is the sphere of inorganic nature on which he lives. Just as plants, animals, stones, air, light, etc. constitute theoretically a part of human consciousness, partly as objects of natural science, partly as objects of art, his spiritual inorganic nature, spiritual nourishment, which he must first prepare to make palatable and digestible. So also in the realm of practice, they constitute a part of human life and human activity. Physically, man lives only on these products of nature, whether they appear in the form of food, heating, clothes, a dwelling, etc. The universality of man appears in the practice precisely Sorry, the universality of man appears in practice precisely in the universality which makes all nature his inorganic body, his spiritual body, his inorganic body. The universality of man appears in practice precisely in the universality which makes all nature his inorganic body, his spiritual body, both inasmuch as nature is one, his direct means of life, and two, the material the object, and the instrument of his life activity. So in other words, that he works on. Nature is man's inorganic body. Nature, that is, his spiritual body. Nat the whole world is man's, all of nature is man's spiritual body. Nature is the thing that the idea creates for Hegel. It is man's spiritual body, according to Marx. Nature is man's inorganic body. Nature, that is, insofar as it is not the itself a uh, human body. Man lives on nature, means that nature is in his body, with which he must remain in continuous interchanges if he is not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. Now, this is tricky because for man is a part of nature is not the whole story here, because nature is, in fact, man's spiritual body. And so nature is that which exists in man's consciousness, in perfected form, in spiritual form. So do you, do you, do you see, the, the, if, you tr if you don't understand that he's coming from this subjectivist position where the world is being created inside your head, it's very difficult to understand what he's actually talking about. But this, of course, is a religious view. 
a theological view, an ontological view. In estranging, he says, in estranging from man one nature and two himself, his own active functions, his life activity, estranged labor estranges the species from man. It changes for him the life of the species into a means of individual life. So what he's saying here is that with the, the fact of divided labor, you end up estranging. Man is estranged from the product of his work. His work isn't merely creating that which he's envisioning in his mind anymore. It's actually doing somebody else's bidding and in exchange for money that he uses to purchase the things that he needs to live like food. And so it changes for him the life of the species into the means of individual life. So individual is not a good word in Marx land. You want social man, not individual man. Individual man is the man that's been estranged from the collective, from the social. Uh, and so the goal of the, the commune, the communist ideal, is to make man back into social man. That's no longer individual man. And the division of labor makes man think in terms of his own individual needs. And it changes for him, in Marx's own words, the life of the species into a means of individual life. The life of the species is work. First, he says it estranges the life of the species and individual life. And secondly, it makes individual life in its abstract form the purpose of the life of the species. Likewise, in its abstract and estranged form. For labor, life activity, productive life itself, appears to man in the first place merely as a means of satisfying a need. The need to maintain physical existence. Yet the productive life is the life of the species. It is the life engendering life. It is life engendering life. The whole character of a species, its species character, is contained in the character of its life activity. And free conscious activity is man's species character. Life itself appears only as a means to life. The animal is immediately one with its life activity. It does not distinguish itself from it. It is its life activity. It is its life activity. Man makes his life activity itself the object of his will and of his consciousness. He has conscious life activity. It is not a determination with which he directly merges. Conscious life, I'm sorry, conscious life activity distinguishes man immediately from animal life activity. It is because it is just because of this that he is a species being, which means that he has human nature. Or he has he has a higher nature, really. Uh, a a being that's aware of itself as a species, or it is because he is a species being that he is a conscious being. That is that his own life is an object for him. Only because of that is his activity free activity. Estranged labor reverses this relationship so that it is just because a man is a conscious being that he makes his life activity, his essential being, a mere means to his existence. So when you work for somebody else, you're no longer out creating the world according to your consciousness in that subjective religious view where your work is now sacred, that it's making this, the, the world and thus humanizing it and thus making you and thus humanizing you. You're now doing somebody else's work for them, so they're not even engaging in productive work to have this spiritual transformation through work, through the sacrifice increment of work. And meanwhile, you're not achieving any spiritual gain from it because you've reduced it to a mere activity of obtaining what you need to live through uh, the artificial construct of money that's being exchanged for your work, which has become estranged labor. In other words, estranged meaning the same kind of estrangement as when God kicked us out of the garden. On the commune, everybody's working in the garden and everything's great and the, none of the labor is exchanged or ex estranged because you're just doing what you're doing in the garden. But when the tyrant God kicks you out, which is the division of labor uh, for Marxism as a theology, now you're doing somebody else's work. And so you're not – he's not spiritually advancing through his, his spiritual work. You're not spiritually advancing. It's all just become – tilling the soil, backbreaking labor, and at the end, death, uh, if we want to get a little bit parallel to Genesis. So going back to Marx, in creating a world of objects by his practical activity in his work upon inorganic nature, man proves himself a conscious species being, that is, as a being that treats the species as its own essential being, or that treats itself as a species being. In other words, that it's self-conscious. Admittedly, animals also produce they build themselves nests, dwellings like the bees, beavers, ants, etc. 
but an, but an animal only produces what it immediately needs for itself or its young. It produces one-sidedly, while man whilst, let's use the fun one, whilst man produces universally. It produces only under the dominion of immediate physical need, meaning the animal, whilst man produces even when he is free from physical need and only truly produces in freedom therefrom. An animal produces only itself, whilst man reproduces the whole of nature. Subjectivist. An animal's product belongs immediately to its physical body whilst, a man's freely, whilst man freely confronts his product. An animal forms objects only in accordance with the standard and the need of the species to which it belongs, whilst man knows how to produce in accordance with the standard of every species, and knows how to apply everywhere the inherent standard to the object. Man therefore also forms objects in accordance with the laws of beauty. It is just in his work upon the objective world, therefore, that man really proves himself to be a species being. In other words, conscious being. In other words, the pinnacle of life, a creator. This production is his active species life. Through this production, nature appears as his work and his reality. Through this production, nature appears as his work and his reality. You picture the world, you work to make it, and it appears, nature, your inorganic, in other words, spiritual body, appears as his work and his reality. The object of labor is therefore the objectification of man's species life, for he duplicates himself not only as in consciousness, intellectually, but also actively in reality. And therefore he sees himself in a world that he has created. And tearing away from man the object of his production, in other words, through the division of labor, and tearing away from man the object of his production, therefore estranged labor tears from him his species life and his real objective as a member of the species and transforms his advantage over animals into the disadvantage that his inorganic body, that's his spiritual body, nature, is taken away from him. Similarly, in degrading spontaneous free activity to a means, estranged labor makes man's species life a means to his physical existence. The consciousness which man has of his species is thus transformed by estrangement in such a way that species life becomes for him a means. And so that's heavy. That's not mere philosophy. This is deep ontological claims about the nature of man, the nature of being as man, what separates man from beast or man from animal, uh, and what the effect of this fall of man through the division of labor, where we're no longer social man anymore, although in a strange little social pods called tribes or communes, we're now individual man who has to work for himself and that is able to be exploited by selling his individual labor to somebody else. Now, neither is, like I said, producing, there's, there, neither is doing their spiritual work, neither is creating nature and by creating nature, creating society and by creating nature and society, creating himself. Uh, and so the ejection from the garden for Marxist theology is the act of dividing labor. So this creates, though, another dialectical spiral that we can see, which is man does work and work creates freedom and authentic work creates freedom and liberation. But freedom and liberation is what makes man man instead of beast, which allows him to do work, which allows him to create more freedom and liberation. So you have this teleological process to 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 man a relationship between man work and freedom and at the end when does this dialectic end when the whole thing synthesizes to where you have truly free men whose work is all just the projection of their uh their sacred labor their their will to work so man creates himself into a truly free man in this way and the name of that truly free man is social man because social man is a man that realizes he lives in a society as george costanza once yelled and that he is therefore not exploiting any other man and stealing from him his fundamental nature or estranging him from one another and the product of his species labor or species effort or whatever it was, uh, 
the man bootstraps himself to total freedom, just like he bootstraps himself as a species being in the Marxian theology. And the end of this rainbow is communism. When we get to complete uh, social man who has achieved the goal, which is to complete the complete to co- create the complete independence of man. And we get a sense of this, actually, we can turn back to the economic and philosophic manuscripts from 1844 to really get a taste of what in the world Marx is talking about. I know this is heady and weird, but, you know, a little um, further down, uh, 30 pages or so further down in this copy that I have in front of me, um, we have Marx talking about being and existence and creation and all of this. And he says, a, and this is actually what where Vogelin was quoting where we began, a being only considers himself independent, Marx tells us, when he stands on his own feet. And he only stands on his own feet when he owes his, exist, when he owes his existence to himself. Okay, so we can't be subject to God because when we don't stand on our own two feet. We can't be children of God because we don't stand on our own two feet if we are children of God. Because we would owe our existence to our creator. So we have to owe instead, in the Marxian theology, our existence to ourselves as men. Man must owe his existence to himself. God has to get cut out. He's going to go into the whole thing about the parent, but the key here is that man... Let me read that again. A being only considers himself independent when he stands on his own feet, and he only stands on his own feet when he owes his existence to himself. So this whole idea that God the creator, he would see this in the Gnostic way, that this was a lie. And in fact, as we saw from his uh, critique of Hegel at the beginning of this, earlier in this podcast, uh, he sees he would see actually... Um, Religion is being, you know, a construction of man, and therefore God is being a construction of man. And so man created this construction of God as as an ideology to justify why he's doing what he's doing and why he's not standing as man himself, in himself. We haven't even got to the scary part of this theology yet, by the way. So back to Marx, a man who lives by the grace of another regards himself as a dependent being. So if you live by the grace of God, you are a dependent being. He says, but I live completely by the grace of another if I owe him not only the maintenance of my life, but if he has moreover created my life, if he is the source of my life, when it is not of my own, sorry, when it is not of my own creation, my life has necessarily a source of this kind outside of it. The creation that's capitalized in italics, the creation is therefore an idea very difficult to dislodge from popular consciousness. The fact that nature and man exist on their own account is incomprehensible to it because it contradicts everything tangible in practical life. The creation of the earth has received a mighty blow from geognosy, geognosy, I guess. Um, It's like gnosis attached to geo. That is, from the science which presents the formation of the earth, the development of the earth as a process, as a self-generation. Generatio uh, uh, equivoca is the only practical refutation of the theory of creation. In other words, the world created itself. Uh, Now it is easy to say to the single individual what Aristotle has already said. You have been begotten by your father and your mother, therefore in you the mating of two human beings, a species act of human beings, has produced the human being. You see, therefore, that even even physically man owes his existence to man. Therefore, you must not only keep sight of the one aspect, the infinite progression which leads you to further inquire, who begot my father, who his grandfather, etc. You must also hold on to the circular movement, sensually perceptible, in that progress by which man repeats himself in procreation, man thus always remaining the subject. You will reply, however, so this clearly shows that he doesn't really understand evolution, by the way. You will reply, however, I grant you this circular movement. Now grant me the progress which drives me ever further until I ask who begot the first man in nature as a whole. And I can only answer you. Your question is itself a product of abstraction. Ask yourself how you arrived at that question. Ask 
yourself whether your question is not posed from a stand to standpoint to which I cannot reply because it is wrongly put. Ask yourself whether that progress as such exists for a reasonable mind. When you ask yourself about the creation of nature and man, you are abstracting, in so doing, from man and nature. You postulate them as non-existent, and, le and yet you want me to prove them to you as existing. Now I say to you, give up your ab abstraction, and you will also give up your question. Or if you want to hold on to your abstraction, then be consistent. And if you think of man and nature as non-existent, then think of yourself as non-existent. For you too are surely nature and man. Don't think, don't ask me, for as soon as you think and ask, your abstraction from the existence of nature and man has no meaning. Or are you such an egotist that you conceive everything is nothing and yet want yourself to exist? And so that's pretty intense. Um, just to kind of pause. You can see this is where Vogelin accuses him of being an intellectual swindler, sidestepping the question, the fundamental question of ontology, and basically creating man as this b brute fact of the world that has then bootstrapped itself into the state that it's in now. And you can see the kind of very Marxian flavor. He says, you know, don't ask questions, etc. Vogelin takes him to heavy task for that. But then he does the typical Marxian thing. He insults you. Or are you such an egotist? Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't even really matter what he says. You know, basically cut this out or there's something wrong with you. Um, intellectual swindler is the word, again, Vogelin uses for this. You can reply, do not want to postulate the nothingness of nature, etc. I ask you about its genesis, just as I asked the anatomist about the formation of bones and so on. But since for the socialist man the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor, nothing but the emergence of nature for man, so he has the visible, irrefutable proof of his birth through himself of his genesis. Since the real existence of man and nature has become evident in practice through the sense experience, because man has thus become evident for man as the being of nature, and nature for man as the being of man, the question about an alien being, about being above nature and man, a question which implies the admission of the unreality of nature and of man, has become impossible in practice. Atheism, as the denial of this unreality, has no longer any meaning, for atheism is a negation of God and postulates the existence of man through this negation. But socialism as socialism no longer stands in any need of such a mediation. It proceeds from the theoretically and practically sensuous consciousness of man and nature as the essence. Socialism is man's positive self-consciousness, no longer mediated through the abolition of religion, just as real life is man's positive reality, no longer mediated through the abolition of private property through communism. Communism is the position as the negation of the negation, and hence is the actual phase necessary for the next stage of historical development and the process of human emancipation and rehabilitation. Communism is the necessary form and the dynamic principle of the immediate future, but communism as such is not the goal of human development, the form of human society. And so this is Marx talking um, seriously out of his ass about the origin of humanity. And he says, for the socialist, we just see that man is man and nature is nature and we are in practice actually there. And therefore, uh, says for the socialist man, the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor, nothing but the emergence of nature for man. So he has the visible irrefutable proof of his birth through himself, of his genesis. And the real existence of man and nature has become evident in practice. So, for the socialist man, the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor. So for Marx, man is creating man through the process of history. And man is creating himself by realizing that he is a man in this process. So for man to realize that he is man in himself, which is along the path to uh, becoming social man or socialist man, he first has to realize his potential for full independence and eventually to 
to be man in himself, he has to realize his full independence, independence from God, independence even from his parentage. Man as creator placed in place of deity. That's what's going on in the Marxian theology. Man, each man has to become his own creator. Theory and practice in place of religion, or really as a religion, is what's going on. Theory and practice, theory and practice, socialist theory, explaining what's happening in practice until those two fuse, as we've read before, and I'm going to read again from the Marxist.org site. So let's take a look at what that means. Theory and practice have to fuse, but theory and practice, aka praxis, are going to be the thing that takes the place of religion and actually become religion. Practice and theory, this is the entry, this is again, you're going to see deep theological undertones that make more sense of this. This is the entry from Marxist.org on practice and theory. I've read this on another episode or two of the podcast. Practice means activity with a means and an end. These words, practice, action, activity, praxis, labor, behavior, are used with different meanings by different writers in different times and different languages. As I said, I'm going to separate that work is the sacred thing that Marxists do, and it's not perfectly consistent with Marx's use. Labor is what happens when it's appropriated by bosses, by capitalists, by the division of labor. And activity is what you do when it doesn't have a conscious direction in mind, so like what animals do. The crucial point is that for Marxists, Praxis is inclusive of its mental, theoretical, or ideological aspects. These are all different, by the way. Mental means that you have the vision in your mind. Theoretical is that it conforms to theory. And ideological means that it's born in ideology. And ideology is this whole topic we need to talk about with Marx. Um, Maybe ideological can be talked about right now. Ideology for Marx is badly misunderstood. I actually didn't fully understood it, understand it, but I had a good idea about it. And then I read Charles Mills' From Class to Race, where he explains how we went from being a classical Marxist to a critical race theorist. Um, it's an interesting book. In the first chapter, he actually says basically every Marxist in existence is wrong about what Marx meant by ideology. The simplest thing to say, just to keep this short at the moment, is that ideology for Marx is the set of justifications that people give for no- doing work that's not productive, but in particular for making other people work for them. So priests create God as an ideology and religion, and they they do all their crap that they do as priests so that people will feed them. And so they aren't doing any productive work whatsoever in the ideology of religion and the ideology that people need religion and spiritual guidance, etc. from somebody like a priest is this set of justifications given for why the priest needs to be doing what he's doing instead of doing productive labor uh, in the field. They are being re-educated in the gulag and then sent to the field to do that. The the lawyer isn't doing anything of any actual practical production value. He has, He's not doing real work. He's just hustling paper and arguments and all of this stuff. And so he has an ideology about the law and why the law needs to exist this way and that way so that he can understand it and mediate it for people who don't have the capacity to understand it. So he has an ideology about the law that justifies his existence as a lawyer. And in general, ideology is whatever idea justifies superstructural work in that regard and is in fact continuous with the superstructure itself uh, within Marx and Marxian thought. And so um, that what we have here then is that uh, from the crucial point is that for Marxists, practice is inclusive of its mental theoretical or ideological aspects. These ideological or mental aspects can be abstracted from practice only relatively. The contrast between theory and practice is always only a conditional and relative one. Practice is active rather than being a passive observation and is directed at changing something. So you must be in the process of trying to change something for it to count as practice. Practice differs from activity in general because practice is inseparable from theory, which gives its means and end. So here's, before I continue, I'll have to read that sentence again, but get get a hold of this. When I said the only real work is socialist work, that's what I'm talking about. Because practice has to have that idea in the head. So it's not, acti- the difference between practice and activity is what I was saying is the difference between work and activity. Almost. There's another component though. Work and what's different? What's the difference between work and activity is work. The worker has a vision of what he's creating in mind and is going to 
and, and it already exists, according to Marx, in his consciousness. It already exists, and he's bringing it about as creator into the world, and he's going to understand himself better as creator as a result, and uh, understand himself as more human now that he's humanized his environment with the picture that he had in his mind that was fully subjective. So he brought the subjective into the objective world and then understood himself better as a subject as a result. Uh, it, that's what's going on. That's activity. Practice goes beyond that. Practice is also inseparable from theory, which means that the only kind of activity, the only kind of work that counts as practice is work that's in coordination with theory. And theory means Marxian theory, and which gives its means and end, while activity or behavior usually includes unthinking reflexes. Practice is only enacted through theory. And theory is formulated based on practice. So that's that wheel that I, the dialectical wheel I told you about earlier. You have theory that inspires action. The action is practice if it's in light of theory. So action, it should say it inspires practice. And practice requires reflection, which is going to reform theory and then give rise to new practice. And you have this dialectical wheel of becoming until what, according to Hegel, when theory and practice fuse once again, which we're about to hear in the Marxist religion what's going on here. When the theory and practice, when the practical idea and the theoretical idea fuse into the absolute idea, you have the eschaton uh, for Hegel. So in Marx, we're going to take that out of the idea of idealism. So it's not going to be theoretical idea and practical idea fusing into the absolute idea. It's now going to be theory and practice becoming unified into a single kind of theory practice thing that is purely, perfectly theoretically informed activity that has a means and an end, and that means and end is informed by theory and therefore is socialist. And so when practice and theory become the same thing, theory practice, and they're no longer divided whatsoever, that's when you've achieved, uh, that, that's the kind of thing that social man is doing in socialist society, which are also at that point fused. So he says, whenever, so that they say, this is Marxist.org, Whenever theory and practice are separated, they fall into a distorted one-sidedness. Theory and practice can only fully develop in connection with one another. That's what I just described with the dialectical wheel. Human activity is always purposeful, but in the earliest stages of development of society, before the development of the division of labor, there was no separation between theory and practice. That is straight up, before we got kicked out of the garden by the original sin of division of dividing labor, Theory and practice were unified. We actually lived in communist pods, communist gardens. Everything was perfect. We hadn't even had to invent the ideology of a god that's that's our jailer here and that's lying to us and whatever else, and the snake is right, blah, blah, blah. Human activity is always purposeful, but in the earliest stages of the development of society, tribal societies, before the development of the division of labor, there was no separation between theory and practice. With the development of the division of labor, the theoretical side of the development of human activity separated out from the practical aspect of that activity with supervision of labor uh, becoming a distinct activity in itself. The distinction between the object of practice, which is changed, and the means of practice, which is used up, is important in making sense of practice. It should also be noted that one has practice in general and practices, each of which is directed toward specific ends and using specific means. Practice is the criterion of truth. In fact, Marx went further, by the way. He held that practice is the substance of truth. What truth actually is made of is practice, and we're going to get to that. In this sense, practice must be understood in its broadest sense, inclusive of the, inclusive of the many kinds of mental and material activity which contribute to changing knowledge and the world. So that's a hell of a deal. So now we kind of understand how this, this religion works, though, but there's a gigantic rub. There's this huge problem so far with a subjectivist view, and it's rooted in the subjectivist view, and it's really simple. Um, there are other people. So you have a subjective view of the world, and you are bringing that world into creation through your life processes or whatever the hell you called them, and thus making yourself into a species being, and so do I. And maybe you and I don't have the same picture in our head. We don't have the same subjective consciousness. Other people 
In fact, all the people might have different subjective consciousness, and that spirit, that geist of society, only unifies them so much. In other words, the problem of subjectivism and the idea that you are creating the world that exists in your head, and that really maybe is the only world that exists at all, is that there are other people. If you and I go outside and we look at an object in reality, let's say a tree, I can point to the tree and you can, you'll see the same tree. And I didn't have to, you could have pointed to the tree first and I would see the same tree. Neither one of us had to condition the other one's subjective experience. Neither of us manifested that tree in our, it's in our subjective reality according to the subjectivist position. Neither of us manifested that such that the other person would manifest exactly the same thing. And so something is being left out from the subjectivist position. And the problem here, and we could talk about various features of the tree, this and that, the bark, and everything you point to, if you point it out, I'm going to see it. But the subjectivist will say, you have to point it out just right before I see it. But that's not even true. You could look at the thing. You could go in private and write down your observations. I could go look at the thing and in private write down my observations, and you would see remarkable concordance. We call this the correspondence theory of truth, that what is true corresponds to what we see and experience in reality or bring it through our senses and through instruments that extend our senses and so on. They call it instrumental reason uh, in a degree, to a degree in this Marxist crap, and they don't like it. Um, so there's this huge problem with this objectivist philosophy and with this idea that the, the, the authentic worker is creating the world and creating himself and creating man by cre- as a species by creating history and creating himself as a species being by creating this and not estranging himself from it. And it's that there are other people with other views. And in fact, there are other subjects who might want to, the biggest problem, the big sin for Marx is that there are other subjects who might decide they want to um, exploit other somebody else, I might decide to hire you to do whatever task or whatever work. I want to bring a vision into the world. I want to chop the tree down and turn it into furniture. And so, but I don't really want to do it. And so I say, I will give you, you know, food or something. If you come over and chop the tree down and you do the work and turn it into a thing, and then I'm going to go have the furniture that I wanted. And so I might reduce your work, your practice to labor because now you are doing activity in in accordance with my vision, in other words, in a sense, my theory. And so the only way that you can resolve this is if everybody has the same theory, because otherwise you're going to have people exploiting one another and they're going to be creating labor from work and that's going to create estrangement and alienation. And in the process of creating estrangement and alienation, whoever is the one that's estranging and alienating is going to have to create an ideology to justify why they get to do that. And whoever's doing the work is going to have to, is going to get brainwashed with that ideology to explain why they should have to suffer having their work uh, estranged from themselves. So this requires communism as a religious object uh, in the sense that everybody actually has to adopt the same view. Everybody has to have the same consciousness so that they are all doing the same work. They have to have the same social consciousness so that their work is toward the same ends and using similar means, or else it doesn't work. The problem of the faith of communism or of Marxism, because it is ultimately subjectivist, is there are other people who might not think the same way, who might see a different approach. They are the problem. They break the religion. And you can see where that goes. History, real history, not capital H Marxist history, has taught us. So communism has to become the eschatological end that provides the impetus for would-be socialist man to do his work to create the socialist society. Because then communism is the shared goal, the shared end in which everybody, and why is it the right one? It's because now everybody has the same subjective vision of the world. They have the same theory that they're putting into practice. When they have the same theory that they put into practice, doing their work, then they are creating the same vision in unity with one another where nobody is exploiting anybody else and there's no need to generate an ideology to justify the exploitation. And so the 
vision in your head that you are trying to produce through your socialist work has to be communism as the eschaton. He, Marx said, of course, we just read that, that that's not the end goal, but that's the next big stage of human history. And I guess we can figure out what the end goal is from there. But this is the utopia where uh, communism, where everybody is free from all exploitation, all etc. And it only can come about when all subjects are holding it as the theory that informs the practice that is the authentic work where there's, again, a stateless, classless society. The point of an ideology is to uphold a class that is either managerial or priestly or whatever that gets to divide labor. So communism becomes the religious object that socialist man is holding in his mind and trying to create in the world through the process of social socialist work that he then will reflect back into himself and see the world more in terms of that by seeing himself increasingly as a social man. That's the theology of Marxism. That's the religion of communism. Why? Well, we can go back to the German ideology, which Marx wrote. Only at this stage, he says, which means under communism, does self-activity coincide with material life, which corresponds to, develop, to the development of individuals into complete individuals and the casting off of all natural limitations. Notice that, the casting off of all natural limitations. Man is incomplete. I told you that's a foundational axiom of this theology. And in fact, We'll come back to this casting off of all limitations. So put that in a book, a bookmark in that. Um, only at the stage of communism does self-activity coincide with material life, which corresponds to the development of individuals into complete individuals and the casting off of all natural limitations. The transformation of labor into self-activity corresponds to the transformation of the earlier limited intercourse to the intercourse of individuals as such. This is the essential point on Marx. Marx's chief obsession then, the work, meaning the work, cannot be estranged from man through the division of labor, nor can it estrange man from himself or others or his species being or what it means to be a man. The only work that is the work must be socialist work, socialist work, send in the social workers, must be socialist work, work that is designed to make man in his own image that is man meant to live in society, which is a social phenomenon. Man recognizes himself as social man or socialist man, man that is in favor of social, a social existence as the uh, product of his species being. But the problem is that man, the reason that man's doing this is to obtain freedom. So, so man re does this to retain his independence as man in himself, man that's created himself while he lives in and makes a society. Otherwise, we've got a problem. Man would be objectifying other men. The process of objectification would cause them to lose their sense as subjects, thus creating domination, reducing them in some sense to mere animals. And the way that that occurs is through the division of labor. And even believing that labor can be divided causes that. So that's the chief original sin. But for work to be authentic, it must be the, the religion of communism demands the theology of Marxism is for work to actually be authentic. It must be theory informed socialist work done by socialist man who has the process of making himself bootstrapping himself into communism as his chief objective. And if everybody isn't doing it, then it's not going to work because there's going to be the need to dominate one over the other. And so what will happen is something like the Soviet Union, where the people who think that they're doing this establish for themselves a, so a Soviet ideology or even a Marxist-looking ideology, a Leninist or Bolshevik or whatever ideology that they use then to dominate other men. And that's why real communism, they say, has never been tried. The problem is the people who create the division of labor, whether it's Soviets or whether it's capitalists. That's what Marcuse's work throughout the 60s is all about. So the people who create the division of labor or the fall from the garden are ultimately subjects who are exerting their subjectivity over the subjectivity of others, which is dominance, which thus objectifies them, which is estranging them from their, their labor, alienating them from themselves and each other and their, the fruit of their work, and which is to say enslaving them. <laughs> 
by one means or another, whether that's wage slavery or literal slavery or whatever Marx, Marxists want to complain about. They do this by turning their free work, which a free socialist man does in service of socialist theory, work becomes work is practice, right? So it's social, it's theory informed. They turn work into labor and that transformation of labor, which is work for somebody else's theory or vision, creates estrangement and alienation. And that's Marxism's unforgivable sin. In other words, the unforgivable sin of Marxism is that people might have different ideas about the world and man's lot in the world. Hence, it's not even just collectivist, but naturally, intrinsically totalitarian. The, as I said before, the way that this division of labor is justified is what Marx calls ideology. Marxism claims it is the end of ideology, and the way that ideology is ended is by raising the consciousness of what ideology actually is, a justification for a division of labor and the domination that it produces, so that you can create the master-slave dialectic, so that you can create the revolutionary potential. So as Marx said, violence is the midwife of revolution. You will have the probably violent revolution that's going to overthrow the society and turn the wheel of the Marxist religious dialectic another revolution. I think revolutionary being a pun there or a double meaning is kind of funny. So the Marxian view is that ideology is any systematic justification for domination or hierarchy or division of labor whatsoever. Why the priest, the priest creates religion so that he can tell people that he needs to be fed so that he can minister to people. The lawyer works in there, creates the law so that he can tell people that he gets to do this non-productive work so that he can manage legal affairs. And this the, the society creates a whole ideology that we need priests and religion and lawyers and politicians and all of these things and a state itself. It creates this ideology that this is how it works because it needs to, all the people who work at that strata of society, stratum of society need to justify their own participation in the hierarchy rather than equalizing themselves where downward to the level of production. That's the Marxist theology. So this holding of ideology is not possible, according to Marx, for socialist man, because socialist man understands the difference between work, activity, and labor. And he's conscious of the fact that Work is activity that is informed by theory, and he's conscious, which is the understanding, as Marx would have it, of historical conditions and how those have made history and made man as the uh, subject and object of the object of history, particularly as time has gone on. And also he understands the difference between work and labor, which is where one person ex dominates another by exerting their subjectivity over the place of the others. Um, so socialist man can't possibly be an ideologist because there's no need for an ideology when there's no division of labor and when all work is actually uh, theory put into practice, especially if it's highly evolved theory. And if socialist man is fully committed to being a social man that lives in a social society that is the product of socialism, the philosophy or the ideology, the non-ideology, the anti-ideology of, uh, of uh, having a social man understanding his role as a truly social animal, uh, then, then he can't possibly be an ideologist because he rejects ideology. So social man, according to Marx, re Marxism is not an ideology, according to Marx, because social man lacks any ideology because social man understands no justification for any domination whatsoever. So again, that's why the Soviets can be said, or Mao or whoever, every failed communist experiment in history can be said real communism has it. Real communism hasn't been tried because it turns out that the people who seized power ended up reproducing domination because they weren't truly social man, because they weren't man who had true, uh, absolute equitarian, not equality, but equitarian liberation as their vision, uh, where everything is perfectly equal and everybody is as equals, etc. So in the Marxian theology, Man becomes social man by doing the work, socialist work, whatever that happens to be, whether that's material socialist work, like labor organizing in the Marxist way, studying Marxist theory and having revolutions, or whether that's cultural socialist work, which is whatever the hell critical race theorists are obsessed with talking about race all the time to do, which is basically just grievance mongering, inflaming the contradictions, 
uh, across the stratifications in society, blaming everything that you don't like on an ideology. White supremacy is the root cause of everything, according to critical race theory, because white supremacy is the dominant ideology. And it produces a product, a superstructure called whiteness. And whiteness is uh, the ideology of that superstructure is white supremacy, which says that why the people who are, say, white get to have access to superstructural positions, cultural material, etc., while everybody else isn't allowed to have them. So man becomes social man and thus sets himself and all other men free by being social man and making more social men. When everybody's social man, then we're in good shape, according to the Marxist theory or the theology. Man, social man in particular, but man is the creator. Social man is the, the, the target of the unfolding of history. Man is the creator of history by his very activity, which is his life, life activity when it is actually work as opposed to just regular activity or uh, estranged labor. And this is because man is necessarily social. Social man is therefore a conscious man, and social man is man who is aware of the Marxian theology, who is putting theory into practice and then where necessary, dialectically, reflecting upon that to enhance the theory and put it back into practice again. Those are the people who are on the right side of history, by the way. In that regard, social man is man made to live in society, which is ultimately the free society of communism in which there is no domination. That's the Marxian theology. That's the promise. So let me freeze for a half a second on social man is man made to live in society, because this is just a replication of Rousseau's idea. And remember I said earlier that we we're going to come back to the idea of the worker as noble savage. Okay, so Rousseau had this idea of looking at what the colonists, or not colonists actually, colonizers, I guess, priests mostly who were in the colonies were writing and sending back to France, and he completely misinterpreted them, and this is well documented, that he misunderstood what they were saying and envisioned these kind of noble savages, but he, he thought that, here's the thing, he thought Western society, civilized society is too rational, etc., because he's a sentimentalist and he was a romantic and all of this crap, and so not enough instinctual going on, and that's why man is suffering, that's why society sucks, that's why everything's falling apart, that's why everything's gone bad. That, that's where the idea of ideology comes from for Marx. And so, but the, but the savage, as Rousseau had it in these colonized areas, he was truly free, but he was too instinctual. So he couldn't, he couldn't progress beyond a very primitive form of life. And so what he saw is that these things, and this is actually where the dialectic from Hegel, which is dialectical materialism for Marx, this is where the dialectic from Hegel came from, because Schiller saw this idea from Rousseau and taught it to Hegel with the term Aufheben, which is the term at the center of the dialectic that, that Hegel fell in love with and literally based his whole freaking systematic theology, or yeah, systematic theology. I was going to say, I should have said philosophy, but it is a theology. Uh, he based his whole thing off of this idea of Alfhaben, which is this synthetic dialectical thing where you're going to take a thing and keep it in portion and abolish it in portion, but meanwhile, lift it up to a higher level of understanding. And this is what it all comes from. And so, because what Rousseau wanted to do was figure out a way to bring down the rationality, the over-rationality of uh, of civilized society, uh, European society, uh, which has all these problems that he pinned on civilization itself and reason itself. And he wanted to elevate the nobility of the savage somehow by dialectically fusing those two things to something that he called savages made to live in cities. And this was the concept that inspired Hegel that has led to all this stupid shit. And so here we have the idea reinvented in Marxism, where the worker now becomes the free worker who is very much like an animal, except that he's conscious, and especially that he's theoretically conscious if he's proper social man or socialist man. He is, he's a man that's no longer interested in domination. So he is a man that's truly made to live in society, which is a state a true society, a perfect society in the Marxist view, would it be a society with no domination. It is a true society of people who see each other as equals and no one's dominating over anybody else. So social man is man made to live in a society. By implication, individual man or just normal people are not actually made to live in society. They don't have the, the noble 
aspect of the pure worker who has the vision in his mind that he is creating and bringing into the world and thus making his subjectivity object so that he might then dialectically inform his his subjectivity to a higher level, but then to understand that this must reflect off of other people. Other people have to be working in concert with one another. So the consciousness has to be, it's not just like I said earlier, where the consciousness has to all be in agreement so that nobody's dominating anybody else, etc. It it has to be full consciousness of the awareness that we are beings who, we are, as human beings, we live in a society, so we are social, and that the true nature of a truly social society for the Marxist is going to be one in which domination is unthinkable. And so social man is man dialectically made to live in society, which is just a reinvention of one of Rousseau's most dangerous and stupid ideas. Um, and this according to the Marxist theology, generates a free society because it's a, a society in which there can be and is no domination and uh, thus no exploitation, no alienation uh, from the products of one's labor and no uh, estrangement from one person to another or man from himself, et cetera, et cetera, at different ontological levels. So here's the fundamental contradiction. For Marxist theology, man is actually only free if all men are doing this, in which case all men are enslaved by the need to do it. And that's the contradiction that sends tens or hundreds of millions of people to their death because it cannot be resolved. Because it actually is a contradiction. You are not free if you have to have the proper social consciousness and everybody has to have exactly the same consciousness in a almost perfect Borg-like hive mind. Every man has to become social man in order for it to work. This is the contradiction that leads to the justification of killing millions who cannot be re-educated. This is the contradiction that creates the gulag. The gulag is not a prison. The gulag is a place where you are sent to be re-educated into socialist ideology. And if you cannot be re-educated, then you are liquidated. Because... Everyone who is still alive must be social man or else the project can't work. But if the project can't work, we never have a true society. We never get true freedom and everybody is enslaved by the fact of the existence of domination in the world. This is the contradiction that has killed hundreds of millions of people and will kill hundreds of millions more unless we completely eschew this terrible theology, this ridiculous theology. Man is only actually free if all men are social man, in which case every man is enslaved to the need to be social man. So what do we do with this contradiction from a position of Marxist faith? Well, don't ask me, don't, you know, uh, unask your question. But really, it's no problem. If we go back to the Marxist.org archive, we can understand through the dialectical nature of the faith that it doesn't really matter because contradictions are baked in. Contradictions are part of the dialectic. Hegel believed that everything contains its own contradiction and thus is the uh, production of motion, social motion or whatever. And so what do we see from coming from the Marxist.org archive, when they're talking about the dialectical nature of this, since contradictions are a natural part, this is a real quote, I still can't believe this is in print. Since contradictions are a natural part of the real world, Marxists understand that planned contradictions in theory is a strength, while most philosophers see contradictions as the breaking of the system. And so they embrace contradiction Holy, this is why Mark or sorry, Lenin said to accelerate the contradictions in order to hasten the revolution. Because the contradictions will reveal where the problems are. Marxists understand that planned contradictions in theory is a strength, while most philosophers see contradictions as the breaking of the system. This is asking people to hold two contradictory this is the religious commandment of Marxism is to hold mutually contradictory ideas in your head simultaneously and to hold them there without seeing any problem with that until they spontaneously syn synthesize. But indeed, it's not even that. It's actually worse. It's not even a contradiction. It's not even actually a con This thing that I call the contradiction that, that murders t hundreds of millions is not actually a contradiction for Marxist faith at all. Because communism is the state of affairs in which 
all the men who are still alive have this consciousness and thus renounce domination of all sorts, so-called voluntarily. So the belief is that communism, when it's true, when communism is really tried, is that everybody is awakened to this consciousness and therefore holds this consciousness voluntarily. And so they're free to not hold the consciousness, except that they wouldn't because it's actually how they understand the world, because that's the interjected morality that's made them uh, understand and, and, and need uh, the this full expression of the socialist society in order to continue living. So how you get from here to there that's where I've done a podcast that was quite famous. Communism doesn't know how. Communism is not particularly good at knowing how to get to that point where everybody who is still alive has this consciousness so-called voluntarily. And so, as Mao put it, power flows from the barrel of a gun. You know, people had to be re-educated. People had to be liquidated. People had to be killed, whatever. I think the statistic in the Soviet Union was something like a quarter of the males at one point or another were in gulag being re-educated a quarter 25 percent of of the males in the soviet union passed through gulag at one point or another to be re-educated into socialist man and if you couldn't be re-educated and i know people whose grandparents for example in various communist countries were unable to be re-educated they were labeled unable to be re-educated and luckily some of them were able to flee and others were just tortured or killed uh because if you can't be re-educated, that means you must be a defective kind of person who can't have consciousness of reality uh, awakened in you. So you're, how are you any better than a beast? How are you, you, you can't possibly understand theory to put it into practice or to reflect upon it, et cetera, et cetera. But this isn't a contradiction for Marxism because for Marxists, they believe that when you raise the consciousness and consciousness, consciousness raising is the evangelistic commandment that they have to follow, then everybody will espouse this view voluntarily. So it's no longer coerced or forced, even though that's really what's going to happen. Uh, so it doesn't technically enslave everybody. And this fail, they wouldn't say that it's this contradiction that leads to all the deaths. It's their failure to figure out correctly how to put it into practice, how to get to that point. And that failure, not the contradiction itself, is one of the most murderous hiccups in human history. They might have it, but it's, in fact, it's the contradiction itself that's the problem. Um, if we want to get even more deep with this, Marxian theory wouldn't consider this to be a real contradiction for another reason. And that's because of the dialectical relationship between man and society and state. Remember, that was that you have man in himself, wholly independent of creator, of what, parents even. And then dialectically, the man produces a society and the society produces the state. And this is state, the state is then responsible through gulag, for example, to produce the man. Uh, man is only truly a social man when he is also in socialist society. Socialist man might have this idea, but he's not, he can't truly be that until he's in socialist society because he still has to live within the world of exploitation and domination. So he has to have at the very least a socialist state that's trying to push forward into that direction, or he has to live in communism where that direction has been realized as a, not the final, as according to Marx, but the next stage in human history, where um, man and society actually have to be dialectically synthesized so that they are co-continuous into man made to live in society. Man and society have to become co-continuous. This is total, absolute totalitarian collectivism at the heart of this theology. You have to, this is like, you talk about like a religion being a hive mind. This is like explicitly hive mind. Uh, at that point, the work of would-be social man would be to make more, or, or up until that point, I should say, the work of social man is socialist work, which is to make more social men. That's why everything they do turned is all it is, is a, is consciousness raising. It's all they ever freaking do. Uh, the whole point of critical race theory. I've said this many times now, and it's in the coming up book, the forthcoming book, race Marxism, the whole point this chapter five of race Marxism. The whole point of critical race theory is to make critical race theorists. Why? Because they are the race version of social man. They have racial consciousness. And when everybody has social man consciousness, everybody has the same consciousness. Everybody is therefore projecting the same image of the world out into the world and doing the work to create that world simultaneously with nobody dominating or exploiting anybody in critical race theory be through race constantly. So if they just raise consciousness, they don't have to teach anybody to fucking read to do math, your kids at school, they don't have to teach anybody anything useful. All they have to do is raise consciousness. 
And when everybody has the same consciousness, everything they do will be theory informed practice, which is the work. And when they do the work, it is to make more of themselves because when everybody's there, it's just happening. That's like, you know, Ron Paul is at the, the meme waving his hand. It's happening. It's happening. That's where they think that it's going to go. And it happens when everybody is <clears throat> voluntarily made into social man. So the commandment of the religion is to make everybody into social man. And that is going to cause the process of the creation of man in himself to become totally independent, to create the world, the social world is then going to be reflected back into him to increasingly create and what they would call justice, a perfect a perfected world that is the recreation of the Garden of Eden, where the division of labor or whatever cultural labor or manual labor or whatever hasn't yet come into the world. The ideologists haven't been given any justification. Everything is the same. Etc. So it's really a process. The work is to get back into the garden and we get to get back in the garden when we're all on the same page and the same page is called being social man or having, in other words, the historical consciousness raised within you. And everybody has to be on the same page because every subject has to be creating the same Pro, has to have the same means and ends in mind. And when every every possible subject has the same means and ends and they're doing the same practice, when they're doing the same practice and they're creating the utopia, they're creating the garden. And when we create the garden, we see ourselves in the garden and we become the denizens of the garden or the citizens of the garden. Of the garden. And then because it's the garden, we don't need to have a state. And so the stateless, classless society is achieved. That's the faith. That's how it works. That's it. So the the work is to make of social man is until the moment of the eschaton when we have the garden back and we actually have the so, the true socialist society when real communism has finally been tried. The work of social man is to make more social men to raise consciousness so that we will end up creating the socialist society wherein the social or socialist man finally truly exists. He has created the world and by creating the world, he's created himself into perfect social man in the perfect world, perfect society by building out of the jungle of social relations and power and every other thing in, in nature itself, the garden that is the humanized world. And by living in the humanized world, he humanizes himself. This is called praxis. That's what praxis is. It's a religious project. So this is the big solution to the big dialectical riddle of social social man made to live in social society or socialist man made to live in socialist society. Um, the Marxian theology is a project of spiritual renewal and transformation that's at the heart of uh, – in this project is at the heart of a Marxian faith. It is a project of spiritual renewal and transformation through the work where the work is – is practice really practice being theory. It is work that's informed by theory like we've talked about. So it is putting the, the tenets of the theology into practice in the world to where theory and practice become fused, which according to Marx would occur when the division of labor is completely obliterated. It is a project of spiritual renewal and transformation, and its goal is to recreate and re-enter the Garden of Eden, as it were, which is a communist utopia where all the tribes of the world are not estranged from each other, but they're already communist, and all of man's needs are taken care of by the nature of the Garden. And he doesn't have to create this false idea of a god as the warden of the Garden, who's then going to imaginarily throw him out for his own sin, but that sin turned out to be the division of labor. So socialist, social man or socialist man in the socialist society can only truly exist when they exist in tandem. And the, the socialist society, the socialist man, only truly exists when everybody is socialist man or everybody's still alive who does the work for social, socialist society to build and constantly maintain it. That's the nature of the Marxian rainbow, the, the fever dream. So we can even go a little bit deeper though, and we can see even more deeply why this is not a contradiction. The, the contradiction that kills hundreds of millions of people, they can't just put it off. It's actually their relationship to the idea of truth is even baked in. And this is how you can really tell that this is a religion. Truth 
This is straight off the Marxist.org website of their entry for truth. How do they think of the concept of truth? So we're going to get into their epistemology, which, by the way, Marxists have their own word for it. They don't even use the word epistemology consistently. They often use the word gnosiology, G-N-O, however you have to spell it, but it's, it's Gnostic, Gnostic, Gnosiology, theory of knowledge, um, instead of epistemology. Uh, but anyway, th- th- here's their theory of truth. Truth is usually taken, this is straight from Marxist.org, truth is usually taken to mean correspondence of an idea to the world outside thought. That's what we were talking about with a tree. What's true about the tree is what you and I are going to be able to agree upon by observing the tree, which is outside of both of us. Okay, so truth is usually taken to mean correspondence of an idea to the world outside thought. However, following Hegel, Marxists take truth to be something that may be said of a social formation or of social practice itself. The truth of a social practice is always relative, since as Goethe said, all that exists deserves to perish. Sooner or later, everything turns out to be false. Some philosophical currents believe that the truth of an idea can be established by logical deduction from clear ideas. In general, each current has its characteristic criterion of truth. For rationalism, it is reason. For empiricism, it is observation and experiment. Pragmatism makes practice the criterion of truth. In other words, does it work? But like empiricism, pragmatism only knows, or sorry, knows only immediate individual action and misses the cultural and historic historical content of social practice. So in other words, Marxist epistemology or nociology is in fact the putting into practice of Marxist theory. And when it works, it was correct. And then it's true. So when you're actually doing Marxist theory, it's true. And when you're not doing Marxist theory or you're opposing Marxist theory, it is not true. That's their theory of truth. So we see from Marxist theology, truth is that the work that produces progress through history. It's like pragmatism in the view of, you know, whatever works must be true in some sense, where work now means socialist work, the work. In other words, the advancing of Marxian socialist faith. That's exactly like how Hegel saw his own thing as a system, his whole philosophy as a system of science, and that his philosophy was the higher level understanding of science, the Vernunft or Nunft or whatever, instead of the the Verstand, the understanding level of science. So this is no mistake, and it has Hegelian roots as well. True in Marxian faith means that which advances Marxism. So when they talk about reality and lived reality and what live in your truth and my truth and the truths, all these different truths, what they're actually talking about, something is true if it advances Marxism. That's why you have people like Kelly Oliver writing in 89 that we no longer have to have true theories or false theories or be concerned about them. We can only have to worry about strategic theories because that which achieves the Marxist aims, political aims, as we heard, spiritual aims of transformation and renewal. That is the work, and when that's strategically uh, successful, then it's true, according to the Marxian nociology, or a- aka epistemology. So this is a, a epistemology then to add to the other pieces we've talked about, ontology. We've actually talked about the need to do this as, as what is the good. So we've got a system of values. We've got an axiology, a theory of values built up. We have a theory of society, how society operates. We've got a theory of, um, we have lots of the various pieces. We've talked about actually eschatology. We've talked about theodicy, um, in a sense, the big theodicy. We can come back to that. Uh, why is there evil in the world? Well, because of the division of labor, obviously, we got kicked out of the garden. Um, so let's kind of circle back and kind of wrap up. Let's remember that the, the idea that for within Marxism, we start with the idea that man is incomplete, but completable. And he can be completed by realizing first that he can become free by becoming social man who adopts socialist theory and puts it into practice. And that socialist man, by putting it into practice, will eventually, after a revolution, get to live in a society created by social man, which is socialist society. And eventually, social society and social man will become co-continuous, in other words, spontaneous, and that's when it will transform into communism. And so the question becomes, why don't we have that? Well, the answer for them is lack of consciousness. And why don't we have the, the class consciousness, the critical consciousness, the race consciousness, the feminist consciousness, 
We lack consciousness. Consciousness has to be raised. But why don't we have consciousness in the marching faith? It's because historical conditions limit the range of one's consciousness. You, we've heard this called false consciousness. It is conditioned by the heteronymous interests, if we remember our Marcuse from the neo-Marxist era. Historical conditions limit the range of one's consciousness. This is the heart of the ideas that I've talked about multiple times before, material and uh, structural determinism. And I don't really want to get into what structure is in a deep way. It's a dialectical synthesis of the collision between the infrastructure and the superstructure creates the tenuous fibers of how society actually works, which in synthesis, which is the, the, the structure of society. That's what structural racism is. For example, you have the racial infrastructure, meaning the people of color, and you have the racial superstructure, which is whiteness, and that those things are colliding with one another, and it creates a racist structure of society, structural racism that conditions how society actually works. Didn't really want to get into that. Structural determinism is that the structure, therefore, actually conditions people to be able to lack consciousness. So you're structurally determined, if you are in whiteness within critical race theory, you're structurally determined to believe in the white supremacy ideology and therefore have white privilege and be blind to the realities of uh, critical race theory. And if you're in a racial minority, you're being brainwashed by those to accept your servitude, etc. And the same thing within Marxism. If you're in the bourgeoisie, you have all these ideologies that tell you why it's natural for you to be on top in society, etc. Why it's right for you to, to uh, exploit other people's labor and why the worker deserves to be exploited. Like maybe he hasn't gone to school as much or whatever. And, you know, or he hasn't worked as hard as you have, or he doesn't have the merit. Meritocracy is a common thread here in terms of ideologies that are spun by the bourgeoisie. And so the conditions, the historical conditions of the society existing at the time that's along this dialectical process, but not complete, those limit through material and structural determinism what it is you are actually able to be conscious of. And so the Marxist sees himself as basically a step or two ahead in history and bringing everybody forward by raising the consciousness. That's part of the other reason that they think themselves a on the right side of history, because they think they're a step or two ahead and be superior to everybody else and C uh, justified in killing people eventually who aren't coming along because they are hindering the progress of history, which they're further down the road about. But in a more metaphysical sense, the historical conditions don't just have material and structural determinism in terms of one's consciousness, they actually create the limits of subjectivity. And I said we were going to come back to this eventually, and so here is that moment. Marxism is a subject-centered view, and that means it centers consciousness as the descriptor of the world, which, um, because it does that, it also proceeds upon the false belief that the limits of subjectivity are actually arbitrary. We live in this mental world that is the world of pure imagination. It could be anything. Anything's possible. Remember when Marx, when we read earlier that Marx was saying that we were going to transcend all boundaries? Remember that? And it wasn't his exact words, but he said we were going to get past all natural limitations. Well, for the subjectivist view in your head, the, the limits only exist in your head. The limits of your subjectivity, which are the conditioned response of the historical conditions you live under, are all that are preventing you from living in the utopia, from having a perfect world. That's all it is. The limits of subjectivity are your own mental block, but they're created by something outside of you, which is the historical conditions you live in. Marxists, therefore, invert the world and believe that the subjective creates the objective, and of course, by doing that, humanizes it and thus makes it good through the work. But because they believe that the limits of subjectivity are arbitrary, they also believe, as an extension of that belief, that they're creating uh, the objective world, that the limits of objectivity are also arbitrary. The limits of of the objective world don't really exist. That's why they think that they can transcend nature. That's why they think that they can do away with human nature. That's why they have transhumanist projects where they're going to remake man into something completely not man, new man, new socialist man, new Soviet man. Uh, the new man. They're always going to build this. They're going to transcend the boundaries of reality itself. This is why liberation means liberation from reality. <laughs> 
for them because the limitations in the objective world outside are actually the products of the limitations of the subjective world inside. And what's limiting the subjective world inside are the historical conditions and how they actually determine the limitations of your subjective thought, your subjectivity. So we could live in basically an unbelievably perfect, you can imagine it, it exists metaverse if only we would deny the limits that the historical conditions that we live under and the systemic power that we live under uh, place upon our subjectivity, because then we would bring about the perfect, we would bring about whatever's in our subjective mind, the utopia, would be brought about in actuality in the objective world by us doing the work which is us bringing our subjective vision into objective reality that we then come to know ourselves through in this kind of wheel of doom that they think is uh, dialectical progress. Of course, their enemy is like ideology or whatever. Um, objectivity itself, they think, is, a, is an ideology, uh, a justification for why we are limiting our subjective range. Why can't humans fly or whatever? Well, it's because objectively, we have this ideology that says objectively, that's just physically not possible. And so we are using the the ideology of objectivity and that the scientists and the positivists and so on are, are exploiting as they would complain about it in order to limit our subjectivity so that we cannot transcend our own reality. And the ideology of objectivity is actually part of how we do this. This is so inside, this is the most narcissistic, insane shit. And this has been turned into a gigantic theology. And remember, they see themselves. Marx is obsessed with Prometheus. Vogelin takes him to task for this. He talks about Prometheus all the time. You see Prometheus appearing in Marcuse, etc. later in Marxist work. They see themselves as Prometheus bringing the light of the gods, the fire of the god, to human beings to set them free. Against God's will, of course, because God is actually a tyrant and da-da-da-da-da. Gnostic, Gnostic, Gnostic. And so for the Marxist theology, freeing one's subjective limitations expands the realm of possibilities. Foucault was all about that. Expanding the potentialities of being by expanding your subjectivity. That's all the freaking postmodernists talk about by getting rid of the meta narratives, which are the ideologies. So you can free one's subjective limitations and expand the realm of possibility, both in terms of subjectivity and thus through the work in terms of the objectivity that you are creating and that will then dialectically become co-continuous with your subjectivity. So the work, and thus the successful transformation of the world, teaches this lesson to people and lets them believe themselves as creator, but not any people our creator, because that's how you end up with megalomaniacs who are dominating everybody. It has to be everybody on the same page all the time. Social man working for social harmony in the socialist utopia. Praxis is what's said to be what achieves this. By how? By taking the theory, putting it into action, and taking that theory-informed practice and then seeing what's happening in the world and reflecting upon it. The objective is going to be realized when it is, in the end, synthesized with the subjective, which is what Hegel said would be the, the, the creation of the absolute. And for Marx, that's what happens when social man is able to produce socialist society, where there is now no genuine object out there to dominate any longer. I get it. It's crazy pants. This is their theology, though. This is a religion of being able to suit, turn yourself into creator, but you're only an authentic creator who's not a dominating demon or whatever, creating the division of labor when everybody's working together in the socialist mindset. I, it's, it's so hard to express this. Ideally, uh, no, not ideally. Um, this, this all gets really weird and deep, though, because Marx... Remember, Marx holds that man and his species, that man himself and his species are his object. That means the thing that he does, the work, out of his subjective understanding informed by theory, in other words, praxis, man and his species are his own object. That He said that explicitly. So the work, which is productive work that goes beyond meeting basic animal needs, it's informed by the theory, is... It, it, Whatever that's done upon is the object. And 
Marx holds that man and his species are his object. The work is therefore to humanize the world and man. The object is ultimately an illusion of the subject, who realizes this in the final synthesis, but not before, when the object, man himself and his entire species, has been successfully transformed into social man and social society by doing the work, which is mostly, this is what's praxis, but it's mostly just creating more social man. But in other words, brainwashing people into Marxist bullshit, getting them to adopt this theology. So then in keeping with Hegel, subject and object lose their distinction. They become the absolute because there is neither subject nor object any longer after the abs- after the, the eschaton has immunitized. Uh, there is no domination in Marxist theory if we're talking about material conditions. There's no domination whatsoever. We're now in the communist situation where everybody is equals and everybody is doing the work in the name of the society. Total collective, perfect collectivism. Um, there's, so there's neither subject nor object, but everybody and everything is subject and object at the same time. Subject, object, as they like to do with a hyphen, subject, object, or object, subject, which is the same because the work and what the work is being done on become co-continuous in the end, just like social man becomes co-continuous with socialist society, which is the only context in which he has any meaning or existence. And so subject, what, what would subject object or object subject be? There are subjects who realize that they are their own objects and objects of their own subjectivity to sound like a postmodernist, but it actually makes sense when you understand what the hell they're talking about. It doesn't po- it's not possible. It just, you can understand what they're talking about. And what are these? These are social man, which is man made to live in socialist society. Um, this all comes back to that species being idea for Marx the human nature idea for Marx, it's more or less the will to create, to mold, to shape, to produce through the work, which is theory informed, which is in other words, socialism, of course, plus the various meeting, the meeting of your various needs, animal needs like hunger, thirst, shelter, sex, health, comfort, etc. So in other words, the sacred charge of the Marxian theology is to do the work, which arises from the will to create, which is, in the long run, allows man to be able to see himself as independent and as creator. Or, I guess, in a sense, technically co-creator, because socialist man is, by definition, sort of a hive mind. It's individuals who are not individuals at all, because they all have the same subjective understanding, which is the same consciousness, actually. The molding and shaping process for Marx is not just one then of making things or making the world around you. It's therefore, it's a project of spiritual renewal. It's a project of making yourself and actualizing yourself as a creator. But the actual creator isn't man as in you or me or a man or a woman. It is in fact all men and all women as social man, mankind actualized as the creator of history, understanding that it is mankind itself is the creator of history. And then that every individual person actually is not individual man, they're social man, but they are various facets made in the image of the socialist God. The transformation of inorganic nature into a humanized world is man's so-called life activity by which he makes himself in the species object of his own creative power, in the species objects of his creative powers. So Marx thus places the work, what the same thing that the critical research called do the work. Marx places the work in the place where Hegel had put speculative thought, which is what's supposed to completely renew the world. And Marx quite rightly and quite explicitly criticized Hegel for getting the, that wrong because he said that thinking never does anything in the world, but work does. And of course, like I said earlier, Hegel actually remarks that Work is what actually creates value, and Marx gives him credit for observing that. That's really the point of big departure there. But if we want to take a step back, this isn't all that far from the Hegelian theology that I talked about in another really long podcast, even though Marx claims that it's, it claims that it's a total inversion. Again, recall that for Hegel, the last great synthetic step is the sublation of subject and object into the unified whole in the absolute. So the absolute is the primordial subject, it gave birth to the object in the form of the world so that it would have an absolute an object other, 
abject other, not object other, sorry, abject other against which to compare itself and to understand itself. And when, when it realizes finally in the end, the eschaton arrives, the end of the end of history arrives, when the subject realizes that the object that it created is just an extension of itself, it's, as Marx had it, it's inorganic body, it's spiritual body. So for Hegel, that's when the absolute or the deity actualizes in the realization that there is no difference between its subject, its position as subject, and the object that is uh, the result of its own creative capacity. Marx does away with the absolute and replaces it with man and himself, so the deity gets replaced with man. So man becomes the creator of man, just like we read out of the uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts, where he, he dodges the question that Vogelin calls him an intellectual swindler for. And so man cre becomes a creator of man both as his own, uh, both as subject and as his own object, and at the level including of species. The spe all of mankind is also the object of man and his subjective will, and that's why it becomes social man has to be transformed. The entirety of the species has to be transformed into socialist man, not just the individual man. So doing the work transforms you, but doing the work is also doing things that transform others so that the entirety of the species becomes socialist man. And he transforms the world and thus himself through this so-called life activity. And the product is socialist man who lives in socialist society. So through this process in the Marxian theology, man realizes that he in his own nature is both author and object, creator who creates the world and in it himself, and thus he's wholly independent, which is what he's trying to talk about in the uh, economic and philosophic manuscripts. So like I said earlier, this is in a way like building the garden out of the world. It is humanizing the jungle of the world, where the world is ultimately going to be society in the end the whole world humanized, nature humanized, and its various historical conditions up to and including that point in history are all just part of that process. So anything bad that happened was part of the process of that unfolding by putting these various contradictions in conflict with another that are ultimately the result of the division of labor, which was the error that man never should have committed in the first place. But the first division of labor, of course, was that there was a difference between God and man. Uh, and so God is obviously the first tyrant because he's a Gnostic. This image of the garden that I keep invoking is very intentional because the idea of Marxian socialism is basically to build on earth and thus reclaim the garden of Eden, capital G garden, in part by denouncing God and his condemnation in the fall as false, evil, and tyrannical, like I just said. So again, this is Gnosticism. Marx is a speculative Gnostic. First thing we read from Vogelin earlier in uh, science, politics, and Gnosticism. And so in fact, though, this you have to understand that man's removal, therefore, from the garden, because man created God in the first place, is a self-imposed -imp act, which was based off the idea of creating God to justify the idea of the domination, which was followed from the division of labor that he was doing in the first place. Man fell from the state of being social man to that of being historical man or individual man who sees other men as his objects. And his objective is, through the process of history in the Marxian theology, is to apply Marxian theology so that every man becomes social man again and we reclaim the garden, but now not in its primeval state where the various groups were estranged from one another, but rather where there is absolutely no separation from one to another and it is a global garden. The metaphor is pretty good because in the in the Garden of Eden and in the idea of a garden, a garden is like turning the world into uh, something that provides for all your needs. You grow all your food. So in the Garden of Eden, though, all man's needs are provided for him. All, all the basic needs. You're comfortable. You have to fear no predators. You have all the food you need to eat, etc., uh, the only thing you're not supposed to do is eat from the tree of knowledge, which, of course, Marx would say, well, that was a lie and blah, blah, blah. Um, so in the garden, nature supplies everybody's basic needs. So all of their work is volitional. It is therefore liberated and uh, free, and it is the expression of their true nature as species being. And so their work is all productive work. 
and that is authentic work that brings meaning to him and uh, transforms him into an even better person that helps to actualize him. And so according to Marxism, under the division of labor, which is their original sin, nature can no longer supply people's needs because property rights or capital have come into the world as an ideology that withholds or the, the belief in capital or property rights or, or is ideological such that one man can claim dominion over parts of the so-called garden and uh, withhold its ability to meet the needs of other people. So people must work for that man under domination in order to meet their needs. And in the process, they're alienated from their work. That's what Marxist theory is actually about. And so they're not, and that's the consciousness that part of the consciousness that Marx wants to raise. That's the conflict part of the consciousness. The utopianism is the other part. So in that state, man is no longer in the estranged state, out kicked out of the garden. They're not working to make something by which they can make you make themselves. They're not working for themselves. They're not working for their own spiritual renewal through their work, the hammer and sickle. They're working just to be able to obtain means to meet their needs that were their birthright in the first place. So they are estranged from themselves by labor and estranged from one another by labor. In other words, the, uh, the, the turning of work into an act of domination. So Marx's idea of the division of labor as original sin is that it alienates man from one another. In addition to all of this other alienation, it alienates him from his species being, and as we've talked about. And so since the productive laborer is having his work taken from him through this domination and is alienated from it, his work becomes necessarily becomes a torment which is the toil that you read in Genesis 3. Someone else, according to Marx, because he's a zero-sum thinker, someone else must be benefiting and taking pleasure from his exploitation because Marx is weird and sadistic and hated everybody, really. And the person who's actually enjoying this torment of making other people work for his own subjective view, his own narrow subjective, limited subjective view, that's not a reflection of, remember, like, God is socialist man, period, everybody, when it's actualized, and every individual is just a facet of that God, is an image bearer of the socialist God, and what you have then is like within Marxism is the, the bourgeois capitalist is like a demon who's taken off or Satan that's taken off a part for himself and is no longer reflecting God. He's in fact uh, creating a simulation or a simulacrum of the creative force to exploit and enslave other men by extracting their surplus value uh, at the cost of their alienation. That's the religious view and that's why the bourgeois and the capitalists are hated. And that's why the white in critical race theory and the straight in queer theory, et cetera, are hated by these Marxian theories because they're literally, according to this stupid religion, the equivalent of satanic demons who have stolen away from the, but they, they've taken an image, uh, their own sh small piece of subjective image of what a socialist man would be and created it for their own benefit separate from the whole. And so this, this is true evil in the Marxist religion. Employing other people is true evil. Having division of labor is true evil. Having positions like priests and lawyers is true evil because that extraction of surplus value through the division of labor is the extraction of the man's capacity to apply his productive effort in the process of societal and self-renewal and transformation. You can't spiritually advance if somebody else has caught you. So you are in this, if you work for somebody, according to Marxism, basically as a theology, you are enthralled to a demon. This alienation of one from another can only be overcome, according to the Marxian religion, by raising consciousness that man is in fact a social being, which is to say a socialist being, as he would understand it, and that 
as a social being on the lower level, that means he's the product of social relations that he himself creates and has created throughout history. And so that if we change those social relations to re relations that are perfectly equitable, perfectly redistributive, perfectly just as the Marxist theory holds, then man being a product of those social relations will become just, will become fair, equal, etc. He will no longer be dividing labor. He will have truly become a capital S social man or socialist man that has a completely different consciousness, etc. So by having, in the Marxist faith, by having the right socialist mon mindset, man can be made to see himself as part of the great societal project, which is communism. And by doing that, Man becomes able to overcome his alienation from other men and thus free himself from the domination that exists intrinsically as a result of any division of labor. So now we can tie this up. We, are, we have seen very clearly the makings of a theology here. Not only is there an account from man and his origins, although a bad one, there's also an account of man's telos, his purpose. There's an account. So what are man's origins? Man makes himself. How? Through the processes of history. He is what man actually is. It separates man from animal is that man is able to bring the conscious products of his effort into the world, subject first, creating object by which he understands and elevates subject and becomes increasingly human in an increasingly humanized world. He has a purpose to take this to its complete logical extension and to humanize the entire world and totally himself. In other words, to create the utopia, the socialist utopia or communist utopia. It caught this, this theology comments on the state and meaning of his existence. In other words, it provides an ontology and it also provides an underlying, like I said, uh, teleology and an underlying axiology. We have a understanding of what it means to be a man. As a, a man is somebody who has the capacity to do volitional work, and by doing volitional work, change the world in accordance with his subjectivity, and in accordance with his subjectivity, including his subjectivity acting on other people to change them into a socialist man as well. He's able to change the world in a way that then reflects back into himself and allows him to understand himself and to actualize himself and then engage in spiritual renewal so that the entirety of his inorganic body nature becomes the object of his subjectivity. We have, a, so is the subjectivist ontology. We have an explanation of the tragedies both current and historical of existence. In other words, a theodicy. Why is there evil in the world? We have a theory of evil here within Marxism. It's because the division of labor exists and creates domination, and the, the, dom the domination creates material and structural conditions that uh, condition people. And it leads them to be in conflict with one another, and that conflict has to play out. And so, as Hegel said, history uses people to move along the dialectic and then discard them. So we see Talos purpose and a theodicy, an explanation for evil, joining together here. The tragedies of existence are the result of the division of labor being in existence at all. And if all men were just social man, we wouldn't have that. But the tragedies of existence are the result of domination. So what we must do is end domination by any means domination and in the the means of history the progress of history unfolding are the explanation for evil history as it will be at the end as we read it back from the very end after we've achieved the socialist utopia every bit of this violence say from the soviet union etc can be understood as having been necessary to resolve the contradictions in that moment of history so that we can move to the next moment of history do you see how it's a theodicy do you see how it's an explanation for evil the evil in the world is either the stupid capitalists who are evil and bad in and of themselves or it's the result of the limitations of consciousness imposed by the material conditions and social conditions of the time limiting people's ability to understand themselves fully as social subjects and so all of the terror, terrible violence and all the terrible acts of history are just part of the process of moving history along to where at the end we'll see. And we'll see who was on the right side of it and who wasn't. We have a soteriology, 
It's a fancy religious word, which is a theory of uh, faith. Theory, which is dialectical practice. It's a theory of, of, sorry, not faith, of salvation. Uh, Theory, which is dialectical praxis from the conditions of history are how man frees himself from this estranged and alienated state by putting theory in practice. That word practice, remember when we talked about that, that dialectical praxis is the soteriology. It is uh, the soteriology, the, the theory of salvation. We are going to save all of mankind by making all of mankind social man who lives in socialist society. It has a vision for the potential conclusion of the state of exi- of, of the, the the current state of existence and transition into one that is fundamentally different and better, which is an eschatology, a theory of the end of the world. The end of history arrives when history is no longer having to be made because we've achieved social man living in social society. In other words, communism. It has an, a resulting axiological values program, which is that you have to do the work. You have to participate in this. You have to be on the right side of history. And that axiological values program has, has also a theory of, of epistemology and truth. We talked about that earlier. And this, But this axiological values program gives rise to duties of conscience for every believer. Social man has to be, make more social men, has to act in accordance with theory and practice in all things. He must have rampant evangelism of the socialist uh, doctrine of the socialist faith, the socialist theology, because more people have to be programmed with the social social theology so that they understand it, so that they can become social man themselves, so that they can work toward this uh, heaven on earth that doesn't require a God, the rebuilding of the garden. And of course, there's that epistemology, or like I said earlier, a gnosiology, that connects them all, that truth is that which moves along the Marxist program. That which extends from theory. Remember what he said? Theory is not just the criterion of truth, but its substance. So the Gnosiology of Marxism is predicated on the belief that that which advances Marxism is true and all else is false. Incidentally, the axiology turns out to be the same. That which advances Marxism is good and all else is evil. This is, Marxism is, a theology. It is a full-blown theology. So just to come back to that key question for everybody, who is the God of Marxist theology? Man perfected. He doesn't know he's that yet. His subjectivity is limited by the historical conditions that he's constrained by. But man perfected, man is the God of Marxist theology, man in himself, totally independent from any other thing. But what it really is is the the man at the end of history, the fully synthesized man, the full social man. And which man is the man at the end of history? Well, there's only one. Is it you? Is it me? Is it your mom? Is it grandpa? Is it Karl Marx? Is it Lenin? Is it Bill Gates? Who is the man at the end of history? There's only one man at the end of history, social man, who is every man. And he only truly exists in that perfected socialist society communism, which only comes into existence at the end of history. But when is the end of history? It's when man perfects himself, not just as any individual, but as social man who is continuous with social society. So when all the men perfect themselves by having become the perfect expression and practice of Marxist theory, the God of Marxism then is the projection of man into socialist man who only exists in the utopian future that Marxism upholds as a necessary historical possibility. How is any of this supposed to make sense? We're just going to go back to the Marx quote from the discussion of his origins, the one, the exact remark that led Eric Vogelin to declare him an intellectual swindler. How is this shit supposed to make sense? Don't think. Don't ask me. Now I say to you, give up your abstraction, and you will also give up your question. Marxism is a theology. <laughs>